You're going to see a House Government Operations Subcommittee hearing focusing on the issue of access to credit. At today's proceedings, the subcommittee heard about the Clinton administration's plan to increase the flow of credit by reducing the current number of federal regulations. Subcommittee Chairman John Spratt of South Carolina says he also held the hearing to consider whether new laws might be needed to increase access to credit. The witnesses include members of the banking community who believe that federal regulations are making it difficult for banks and other financial institutions to make loans to small and medium-sized businesses. Today we'll continue the hearings on the credit crunch and efforts that have been taken by the administration and others to increase the flow of credit in this country. This will be the last in a series of four hearings which began with the appearance of Roger Altman, the Deputy Secretary of Treasury, on March 17, 1993. Our first hearings followed closely upon President Clinton's proposals to increase the credit flows in this country, which was announced on March the 10th. Recent economic statistics only reemphasize the weakness of our economy. Last week, there was reported a small decline in productivity, the first such decline in, since 1991, the first quarter of 1991. The Labor Department reported that productivity for businesses excluding farms fell at an annual rate of a tenth of a percent. There's been no improvement in the unemployment rate. It's holding steady at around 7 percent. And in a recent speech made just last week to the Federal Reserve Conference in Chicago, Chairman Greenspan explained how banks are losing their share of financial markets, other than intermediaries, less accessible particularly to borrowers we're concerned about. Consumers and small business borrowers are taking their place. So our hearings today remain very relevant indeed. Our subcommittee has amassed a great deal of anecdotal evidence about the nature of the credit crunch and about its various causes. But no one has submitted to us until recently, just last week, any sort of economic analysis backed up by statistical analysis. This was supplied through a paper which was written by Joe Peake, who is professor of economics at Boston College, and Eric Rosengren, who is the Vice President and Chief Economist at the Fed in Boston. Let me just quote from their conclusions. The pattern of bank balance sheet shrinkage is important. The shrinkage is not concentrated in securities holdings. Loans are declining. More importantly, a large share of the shrinkage occurs in the bank-dependent loan categories, that is, where banks can basically only get credit from banks. And the shrinkage in, is in lending as well as loans already held in the bank's portfolio. Because formal regulatory actions have been particularly widespread in New England, including most of the largest lenders in the region, and these are the loans with few non-bank alternatives. Bank-dependent borrowers who have traditional banking relationships severed may have great difficulty finding new financing arrangements. Because so many bank loans are generated locally, and because informational and regulatory impediments deter transfer of bank capital and credit across regions, evidence suggests that New England did suffer from a regulatory-induced credit crunch. I'd like uh, unanimous consent for this whole study to be made part of our record. That's just one region of the country, but we find evidence of the same occurring for various reasons all over the United States. Let me sum up these hearings by saying that the administration deserves credit for focusing attention on the credit crunch and for the regulatory reform proposals it has released so far. Their package should bring some relief, significant relief, I hope, but further relief may well require action by us, by Congress. I'm not convinced that all the things in the B Rider Shelby Bill need to be done, but their bill does lay out a long list of particulars which surely Congress should consider. If we want to break up the crunch, we could send a clear signal to the banks by just mitigating a few of these rules, mitigating, for example, the million-dollar-a-day penalties for technical infractions, which are bound to deter and chill the extension of credit in questionable cases. We're pleased to have today as witnesses six experienced bankers, business people, and lawyers with an expertise in banking and in lending in particular. They come from different parts of the nation. That was our objective. Our first panel will be made up of two business people, Mr. Olson from Connecticut 
and Mrs. Pope from Chicago. Then we will hear from a banking panel made up of Mr. Gallagher from New Hampshire and Mr. Frampton from Kentucky. And finally, we'll hear from a panel made up of two banking lawyers, Mr. Hernsberger from California, Mr. Puleo from New York. But before turning to our witnesses, let me ask our minority members, Mr. Cox, I was, if he has an opening statement he would like to make, and in his absence, either Mr. Shays or Mr. Zeller. Mr. Shays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to, uh, again, thank you for conducting these hearings and to uh, welcome all of our witnesses. They are experts in their field, and I am looking forward to hearing the testimony from all of them. I would also like to just pay a special note to uh, one of the witnesses, Mr. Leif Olson, who is a constituent in the 4th Congressional District and who had spoken to me four years ago about uh, the credit crunch and uh, what it portended for the United States if we didn't deal with it. Uh, regretfully, I tried to get the past administration to pay heed to his warnings and to his recommended actions, and had they been taken, had they been noted and taken, uh, the credit crunch would have been far less in New England and other parts of the country. I'm very eager to hear the testimony from all of our witnesses, and uh, I again thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zeller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, too, appreciate uh, your holding these hearings, and certainly this is the final hearing of a very successful group of hearings. Uh, before I begin, I would like to recognize Mr. Chris Gallagher from New Hampshire, a nationally recognized expert on the credit crunch. Uh, He's here today to represent New Hampshire Bankers Association. He'll be on the second panel, a guy that I have a tremendous respect for. I found his knowledge of the credit crunch and character lending to be enlightened and extensive. I'm glad he's here to share with the committee some of the problems and concerns that we've had in New Hampshire for the past four years. The lack of credit availability is a major problem that is holding back our efforts to emerge from a very stagnant economy, and we have gone through some very tough times, as you know. Two years ago, this committee had a, held a field hearing in New Hampshire that vividly illustrated the problem. And I hope you, Mr. Chairman, will carry on in tradition. Uh, Doug Barnard, our previous chairman, came up to New Hampshire. I think it would be great I invite you now to hold a hearing back up there uh, so you can kind of take a look at where we stand now after two years. Uh, you'll find that while we've made some progress, there's still much to be done. Oppressive banking regulations, and uh, in, in I could see in the previous hearing, where uh, Bill Brandon, ABA president, stacked up two and a half feet of uh, banking regulations that uh, are now present compared to a half inch one book of 20 years ago. And uh, so it's certainly a great symptom of the problem that we're dealing with. An attempt to facilitate greater cooperation and understanding between the banking and regulatory communities, I recently brought a group of New Hampshire bankers to Washington as a follow-up to our meetings uh, to meet with FDIC officials. And at that meeting, we discussed the regulators' zealous adherence to regulations at the expense of, problem, uh, of common sense problem solving and uh, what can we do to improve the lending environment. It's uh, concerns such as these which stymie economic growth and further strain relations that should be cooperative, not confrontational. I'm pleased to see the administration's uh, proposals to encourage character lending. It is the nature of small business to be innovative and creative. Unfortunately, Fidesha uh, has served to stymie bankers' ability to make such loans based on intuition and knowledge of the individual. Allowing a return to the concept of character lending is an essential step in making credit more available to small businesses. As a result of the hearings we've had in this committee and in the Small Business Committee, as well as my own personal experiences, I'm convinced that we need to go back and look at Fidesha once again. The situation in New England is an excellent example of the detrimental effects of overregulation. We still have not recovered from the problems caused by Firea and, and Fidesha and overzealous regulators. I submit, Mr. Chairman, that Fidesha, enacted in the midst of the savings and loan uh, debacle, is a classic case of congressional overkill. If we cannot repeal Fidesha, we need to go back and look at it again with the benefit of 2020 hindsight and try to fix the problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Mr. Cox, let me ask you to make your opening statement after I let uh, Mr. Rush welcome his witness and uh, make a few opening remarks, and then you can lead off uh, the three panels that we have, if that's all right with you. That's fine, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Rush from Chicago. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I also would like to take this opportunity for thanking you for scheduling uh, this hearing today. Mr. Chairman, one of the witnesses that will testify today is Ms. Consuelo M. Pope, the 
President and the Chief Operating Officer for the Cosmopolitan Chamber of Commerce in the City of Chicago. Ms. Pope has had a long history of addressing the issues as it relates to small business uh, persons in general, minority business persons specifically. She's uh, well prepared to bring forth some issues to this committee, issues that address the area of credit crunch as it relates to uh, minority uh, business persons. I basically have always maintained that there is no more crunch in the minority communities as regards to credit. Uh, uh, the availability of credit is no longer there. I also associate myself, Mr. Chairman, if I might, with the remarks that you made uh, earlier in regards to the uh, president bringing forth this issue, highlighting this issue, making bringing this issue out uh, to be discussed in the body politic, uh, uh, the issue of credit availability in the uh, in general, and particularly credit availability in minority communities and credit availability in the central cities and in the close-in suburbs. Mr. Chairman, I just want to say to my colleagues that uh, obviously you are a, a, a chairman who believe that in order for uh, this committee to, to have the kind of information that it needs, uh, that uh, we need to go out into the different cities, localities throughout the, this nation to hear testimony from individuals. And I want to take this opportunity to thank you for committing uh, uh, and for uh, scheduling a meeting uh, uh, of this committee in Chicago uh, toward the, at the end, either the end of June or the beginning of uh, July. As you know, we've had to put the date back, uh, but we will work out a date, and I want to thank you very much for convening this Absolutely. here in, the, in Chicago. We, we tried to work out June 21st, and now we work on July the 12th. July the 12th, that's, that's a great date. We'll make sure that's a, a successful committee here and there, Mr. Chairman. So I thank you very much, and I look forward to getting the, uh, the testimony from the various uh, participants, including my friend of, of many years. I won't say how long, uh, <laughs> but many years, uh, County Pope. Thank you, Mr. Rush. Our ranking member, Mr. Cox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, too, look forward to the resumption of these very important hearings. Now, the credit crunch is nothing new. It's been with us since 1989. Uh, since that time, credit for small and medium-sized business has virtually dried up. The reluctance of commercial and community banks to lend can be directly attributed to a marked increase in regulation mandated by the Financial Institutions Reform and Recovery Act of 1989, what we call FIREA, and the 1991 FDIC Improvement Act, what we call FIDICIA. Taken together, these laws attempt to eliminate all risk from commercial lending. The net result? is that small business and agricultural loans are being regulated out of existence. Small business loans cannot, by their nature, be risk-free, but nevertheless they are vital to economic growth and job creation. In my view, the regulatory pendulum has swung too far. Paperwork and documentation have replaced sound judgment based on local knowledge. This type of regulatory nightmare must be stopped. Prudent lending that maintains the safety and soundness of the banking industry must be employed. Overzealous regulation that promotes business foreclosures due to a lack of credit is just plain bad public policy. I don't think I need to remind any of our witnesses here today that small business employs about 60% of the private workforce. They produce 40% of the U.S. GNP and 50% of total American private sector output. With the nation's unemployment rate holding steady at 7 percent, small business lending is critical to any economic recovery. Regulatory overkill and increasing paperwork are slowing the nation's economic recovery and costing jobs. While we might be encouraged by the Clinton administration's most recent executive order easing the regulatory burden on healthy financial institutions, it will take more than just rhetoric to free up the flow of capital. We have seen for years that pronouncements at the highest levels have yet to be translated to the regulatory level on the ground. That is why today's hearing is so important. The witnesses appearing before our subcommittee today are the real experts in the credit crunch. They know all too well the everyday problems that regulatory overkill is imposing upon their businesses, banks, and communities. These individuals are in the trenches fighting the war against government interference. 
They understand the ramifications of ill-conceived legislation and the effects that it has upon their lives. It's time that we listen to their stories and act upon their sage advice. We must continue to press the regulators to ease up on healthy institutions and encourage banks to make prudent loans without fear of reprisals. The free flow of capital, regulated by the market, based upon simple standards that will ensure safety and soundness in lending should be our goal. Americans want jobs. Small and medium-sized businesses can create those jobs if regulators pay heed to this simple dynamic. I look forward to hearing the testimony of our witnesses today and welcome their input on this very important topic. And once again, I'd like to congratulate our chairman uh, for holding these hearings. Thank you very much, Mr. Cox. Now let's call our first panel, Mr. Leif Olson and Mrs. Consuela Pope from Chicago. Mr. Olson is from New Canaan, Connecticut. Mr. Olson, your first name is? Leif. That's Leif. Right. I got it correctly. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, if it's agreeable with you, we'll ask Mrs. Pope to proceed first. Uh, in each case, I think you have submitted some prepared testimony. As a matter of practice, if there's no objection, we'll make your prepared and submitted testimony part of the record so that you can summarize it as you see fit. The floor is yours. Thank, thank you, you both for coming. Thank well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank uh, my Congressman, Mr. Rush, and the rest of the members of the subcommittee for this opportunity uh, to address the problems that small businesses have had in obtaining the necessary financing to succeed. Our organization, the Cosmopolitan Chamber of Commerce, is 60 years old. It's one of the nation's oldest business associations and its oldest interracial business partnership. We are the chapter, the Chicago chapter of the National Business League. For over 25 years, uh, thousands have attended our School of Business Management. And uh, when the school was started, uh, it was known that African-American business in our country represented only 1% of all business conducted in America. We recently had a celebration of the 25th graduating class out of that program. And at that time, our speaker, who had been with us when we started the program in 1967, <coughs> noted that African-American business is now 0.5% of all business in, conducted in America. We have assisted over the years our city's largest African-American businesses during their fledging years, and our membership continues to be a network of the smallest to the largest of Chicago's enterprises. Two years ago, our organization pulled together what we call our bank program, which is a loosely tied coalition of our member banks, which number 18. Its purpose was to assist them with screening and packaging small business loans. This effort was followed by the Women's Finance Initiative, which was established by our state treasurer, Patrick Quinn, as an incentive to banks to do lending to female entrepreneurs. The Chamber is one of three organizations which counsel the applicants, oversee the paperwork, and provide technical assistance. The incentive is a linked deposit, a matching dollar amount of state funds placed in deposit in the lending institution. Our city treasurer, Miriam Santos, has a similar program for all small, minority, and women-owned emerging, emerging firms in the city. But because neither program is free to violate the bank's underwriting standards, these and all other special efforts of our financial community to address the credit needs of small, especially African-American-owned businesses, have met with limited success. One of the first problems that we have faced was the restrictive collateral requirements as banks have become extremely hesitant to utilize the primary residence to meet collateral terms. We're aware that our banks do not really want to be in a Simon Legree position taking a roof over a family's head, but often the primary residence is the only appreciable asset that a small entrepreneur has to offer. Receivables, therefore, become nearly impossible to finance. Our businesses do tend to be in industries with low capital equipment, investment and we often lease the space that our businesses are, are located in. <coughs> I'd like to begin to, to summarize a bit here. Um, 
and, and speak for our bankers initially. Um, in an organization like ours, we really are kind of the, the middle of the rock and the hard place. We have members who are bankers, and obviously the majority of our members are small businesses. On the side of our bankers, uh, regulatory issues that you have, have spoken about uh, are literally driving them up the wall, as um, I included in the testimony some, of, uh, some direct quotes from them. In the zeal to protect the depositor and maintain safety and security, banks have severely limited the access to credit for all small business. They have required an abundance of security, have devalued real estate as, co as collateral, and um, the cost of the tedious documentation and int intimidation of bank e by the bank examiners uh, has been spoken of most frequently as I've spoken to our member banks. Quoting from three of them, one said, the bankers are used to living in a highly regulated world. Each year, however, there are new demands, new requirements, and more reports. As regards the Community Reinvestment Act, small banks do not have the advantage of scale to meet compliance requirements. Small banks have to add these duties to the work of existing personnel because it would be burdensome to hire a specialist. Another said it is easier to make loans to Fortune 500 types of companies. Often examiner approval does not relate to whether a loan is current and paying, but to the amount and quality of the collateral and certain documents in the file. Excessive documentation is required in every file, even for customers with whom the bank has a long-standing relationship. And a third said, we have to be responsive to our stockholders. Sometimes it is the path of least resistance. We can be profitable investing in treasury bills and it's less work than the hard to do loans. We see CRA loans as a cost of doing business, but such costs are then passed on to the customer to the extent possible. Now, the Cosmopolitan Chamber of Commerce is hardly in the position of it being in opposition to the Community Reinvestment Act. In fact, we wholly support it and um, encourage its strengthening, if anything. The other side of the issue is uh, one that was, um, it, the, what wasn't said in the report of the U.S. Commission on Minority Business Enterprise last year, uh, as it concluded its work with findings that indicated the growth and progress of minority business, but did not record the findings that African American businesses are in fact on a decline, a great deal of which has to do with the issue of getting credit for growth and development um, because so many of them are in businesses which have such difficulty in obtaining financing. The bridge between these two issues, therefore, is the kind of work that we try to do with the Cosmopolitan Chamber of Commerce. It's the technical assistance, the management assistance, and management training. However, the systematic reduction of such services in our community, which has included over the years federally supported business development centers, state supported, state and SBA supported, in fact, small business development centers, um, and even most recently, the support of local government through community development block grant funds, which have been severely restricted. And in fact, in some instances, uh, HUD has ordered our Department of Planning and Development to not fund direct technical assistance to certain types of businesses that are sorely needed, and particularly businesses that have the, the, the tendency to be more labor-intensive, a job-producing, and I'm referring specifically to construction. The traditional amount of funding for small and minority business programs has been so minuscule that it really has to have very little effect on deficits, and maybe that's the reason that we've been so vulnerable. The impact, however, of strengthening the source of jobs and restoring communities is long-term and is now proven. The work clearly is not finished, and it has been set back by the recent economic uh, downturns and uh, recent <coughs> downturns in the economy. 
We do agree with President Clinton's approach to easing the burdens at the bank level. We support bills which call for reducing documentation requirements when the bor borrower's reputation, character, and financial condition warrant <coughs> and financial condition warrant makes good sense. We would add that the market conditions for business are equally important. The value of collateral should be taken into consideration. However, we also agree that real estate should not be undervalued, nor should the primary res residence be eliminated or, or discounted. Our instinct and in answer to the question of whether we should be looking at legislation uh, versus administrative change, our instinct tells us that we probably can get more done the less we have to deal with new legislation. Um, and we do know that there are things that can be done administratively. Uh, for example, we have known that in our local community that the staff that is working with banks on their community reinvestment um, uh, programs have introduced our organization as well as other programs in the community to those banks as ways to resolve the issue. Essentially, what we're saying is that technical assistance to develop and strengthen the small business so that that business is more bankable is the answer to the issue of whether the bank can provide prudent, secure financing to those businesses. It creates a kind of partnership in which all of the businesses of the community and at the local level, businesses really are more of an interdependent kind, uh, have interdependent kind of relationships than they do really competitive relationships. Our banks need our small businesses in the community, uh, particularly in a community like the state of Illinois where there are uh, so many community-based banks and so many small banks. The small businesses are, are uh, part of their lifeblood and equally those businesses need their banks. We want to strengthen that cooperative relationship and our banks and our organizations recognize that our work in providing that technical and management assistance and training to those small businesses is really an extension of both their work and the work of those small businesses. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Pope. What we'll do is take Mr. Olson's testimony and then we'll put a question to the two of you together as a panel. Mr. Olson. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I wish to thank you for this op opportunity to share some observations regarding uh, bank lending and the current regulatory environment. I would particularly like to express my appreciation to my Congressman, Mr. Shays, for this invitation. And I might also add that I noted that the members of the committee congratulated you on holding these hearings, and I'd like to join with that. Uh, while the administration has uh, spoken up on, on uh, on taking steps to ease some of the regulatory burden. Nevertheless, I think it still takes some political courage in the present environment to step forward and say perhaps it's been overdone in terms of the uh, regulation uh, uh, coming out of the recent uh, wave of bank failures. And I think my testimony today will at least in part uh, support the, the, your, your instincts on this and, and uh, demonstrate that, in that a large part of the cause of the bank failures Went, went un, unrecognized and, and, in my opinion, has not yet been, been adequately addressed. As we know, business loans have not increased in this recovery. Uh, I should add here that I will paraphrase some parts of my testimony. I will not read it in, in its entirety. Uh, the economy is growing, uh, but uh, business loans uh, of banks have not been arising, and this apparent paradox has raised concerns in Congress and in the, in, the, in the administration, and the general conclusion is that everybody has reacted uh, and imposed undue burden on the banks and thus restrained lending. I think there is a certain element of the classic case of burning down the barn to kill the mice in this particular case. And it's not without some precedent in history, incidentally. The similar events took place in the 1930s as well. Before uh, proceeding, I would just like to uh, very quickly capsulize the, uh, uh, excuse me, I'd like to point out that the, that the market now has historically low interest rates and there's liquidity sloshing around so it's difficult to conclude that weak loan growth is due to an unwillingness by banks to lend. I think uh, part of the element is that, there, that uh, given the recent experience, business borrowers and banks are more cautious about debt. But there are, to be sure, regulatory restraints that have played a significant role in holding down loan growth below what might otherwise have taken place. Maybe difficult to quantify 
and some analysts have endeavored to do so, and I, I recognize some of those studies. Uh, I might add that I also concur with, uh, with Charles Bowser, a uh, controller general who testified here on March 17th when he pointed out that in regions and states where banks are relatively strong, the lending is more aggressive, and that when you go into the weaker areas, of which New England is, is most notable, there you have uh, weak lending. And those are the banks that, in fact, right now are subject to uh, oversight and, and uh, close scrutiny by the regulators more than any, uh, any other, uh, more than the, the stronger areas. There is, uh, are some missing elements in the discussion about how we arrived at the present uh, bank lending environment. I'd like to just quickly capsulize the fact that, the, that we had initially a wave of, uh, of failures of savings and loan associations in the early part of the 1980s, and that came about because of the weakening of these institutions from 1979 to eight, 1981 when we had what we call an inverted yield curve, that is short-term rates or higher than long-term rates, so that the cost of funds to, the, to, to savings and loan lenders and other thrifts were higher than the return they were receiving on mortgages. And as they weakened during that period, uh, they then began to reach out for other kinds of lending, notably uh, commercial real estate lending, in order to enhance their earnings and, ex and, and with the expectation that this would strengthen their capital. That inverted yield curve, incidentally, uh, occurred because of a major mistake in economic policies at the time when they were endeavoring to uh, re reduce uh, the rate of inflation. And I realize that is not a subject of this, uh, of this hearing, however. Uh, bank failures began to skyrocket in the second half of the 1980s following the historically large failures in savings and loans. As that severity of this problem became clear, regulators came under fire for failing as their role, in their role as examiners. The regulators turned on management and the, dire and, and, uh, and the directors of problem banks and the management turned on lending officers and lending officers today don't see very much future in taking unnecessary risks and making loans. The, uh, if capital inadequacy and weaknesses in existing regulations lacks examinations, and the failure of bank managements and directors was the cause of the bank failures in the 1980s and continues to contribute to those failures, why did it suddenly happen in the 1980s, and particularly in the second half of that, of that decade? Weakness in these particular areas of bank regulation and management should have produced random failures, but not a wave of failures throughout entire regions and states. Something else happened that has not been conspicuous in congressional hearings and in the extensive analysis by the regulatory agencies. The failure to recognize that something else leaves a void in preventing a repetition of the problem and it applies undue burden in a regulatory area and capital requirements on the other side. That something was the sudden souring of billions of dollars of bank loans, particularly in commercial real estate. It came as a shock to everyone. The immediate reaction was fear. And that's, uh, of course, normal when an unpleasant surprise takes place. Each participant from Congress on down heightened the fear of the next person in the line of responsibility. Raising capital requirements comforts the regulator and uh, uh, automatically comforts bank managements. However, thumbnail capital ratios is a relative matter. There is nothing magic in current capital ratios. There is no evidence that a given ratio prevents a bank from failing. If the volume of bad loans is large enough, it will swamp a bank's capital no matter how much capital it has. The primary defense of a bank's soundness is found on the asset side of the balance sheet and not on the liability side. The ability to generate earnings sufficient to build capital as, as, as assets grow is the next most critical function in creating and maintaining a sound bank. In fact, statutory capital ratio requirements will not only prevent failures, but they dictate, of course, the closing of a bank that could otherwise survive and serve its community. I'm not suggesting unwise forbearance, but instead some judgment rather than a fixed rule. There are banks that, that have survived in the past five years that would have been closed, and major banks that would have been closed had the uh, current capital ratios been in effect at that time. Current capital requirements alone explain why banks have not been more aggressive lenders today. 
Now, loans are made on the basis of information. Standard information includes accounting data, financial statements, real estate appraisals, documentation required by the regulators for each individual borrower on, uh, or each loan. But this omits a key piece of information. That key piece of information was how much commercial real estate was being financed in a given market area. Such information would have shown how much commercial real estate was in the pipeline leading to completion, how it compared with absorption rates, and it would have shown that a sharp increase in vacancies spelling non-performing loans was destined to take place. When the volume of lending was compared with the capital of banks putting those loans on their books, it should have, uh, have uh, set off warning signals. No information is required by examiners which would determine how much capacity or how much product is being financed by all lenders. No data is gathered to show whether ex excess lending capacity was financing an excess supply of products or construction in this case. Every wave of, of problem loans, in contrast to random problems, has taken place because banks lacked information or didn't focus on the total amount of lending that was going on in a single industry or in a, in a geographic area. This is more economics than accounting, and economics is almost totally ignored in the credit function. Commercial real estate lending surged in the 1980s, and I, and I, I have this chart that I, sh that I accompanied in my te testimony that you saw, this extraordinary rise in commercial real estate lending. This data, incidentally, is not conspicuous in the, in the data series that the Commerce Department, uh, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, or the Census Bureau uh, produces uh, on the economy. In fact, a, a great deal of the data on, on uh, real estate is gathered privately. And here we have data that was critical to billions of dollars of losses that took place, and almost no one has focused on it. Real estate values increased in step with the lending, of course, and it encouraged more and more lending. It was a classic product cycle. Each bank looked at each deal in terms of the information provided by that, that borrower. That information did not play up the fact that total commercial real estate construction and process was running far ahead of demand. It obviously was ignored. Uniquely, the examiners were in the best position to see this as they moved from bank to bank and gathered the data. Simple arithmetic should have given them a total figure that signaled trouble. However, bank examiners, I don't believe on their checkoff list, have this kind of, are, 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 do ask bank managements this kind of information. I recognize that you will hear that regulatory, heads of the regulatory agents will, will insist that they did warn uh, uh, banks that, that excessive commercial real estate loans were being made, but it came too late in the cycle, and it was not implemented actively enough to prevent uh, a collapse of loan, of loan values. The uh, surge in, this, in, in real estate lending seemed to be, incidentally, a manifestation of excess capacity in the financial services industry, which is something that Congress may wish to address at some point in restructuring the banking uh, industry, something that's been discussed a good deal in banking. Uh, if this was excess capacity, uh, it, it, came, it became a particularly complex problem given the provisions of deposit insurance, which reduced the vigilance of depositors, and heighten the risk-taking of bank managements in a highly diverse, diversified financial services industry with multiple state and federal regulations. Now, higher capital requirements have also reduced the lending capacity of banks. The statutory fixed capital ratios are causing banks to actually build excess uh, capital as cushions to guard against any anticipated slippage in the ratios. Building excess capital means keeping the growth of assets subject to capital below the increase in capital from retained earnings and other sources. This means slower lending, not necessarily no lending, but certainly slower lending. Now the fear of making mistakes which inhibits risk management has undoubtedly in a degree congealed the normal flow of credit, particularly to small and medium-sized borrowers. 
and I would only emphasize what Mr. Cox pointed out earlier, that it's in the small and medium-sized business areas that our employment growth takes place, and that is critical in this particular recovery, where we see so much downsizing of large companies. The present efforts to ease up a bit on the recently applied tighter regulations, including greater documentation, does not address the fear factor. In fact, fear of reprisal is still widespread in banking, and it suppresses an open dialogue between bankers and regulators and bankers in Congress. President Clinton has endeavored to relieve this problem by providing for a review process when bankers believe regulators' decisions have been wrong. Now, to ease the, some of the trauma that has beset uh, banking and hampered the normal lending functions of banks, I would recommend the following be undertaken. I think that the fixed statutory capital ratios should be revisited, particularly with respect to how much they are actually Im impeding loan growth, and in some cases actually making it difficult for banks to, to grow their capital. If banks can't increase assets because they fear they will violate capital requirements, they will be very selective on the, in the kind of assets that they acquire. The current capital ratios are encu encouraging banks to seek fee income and business activities that do not add to their asset, assets requiring capital. Ownership of, of uh, stock by bank management should be encouraged. There are several studies I mentioned in here that indicate that where you have bank managements owning equity in the, in the banks, the banks have performed better. This is something that could even be noted in the uh, bank rating, in the bank's uh, camel rating. Information which includes conditions in the product area, whether it is commercial real estate or snowmobiles, which, are, which uh, were a source of bad loans back in the 1970s, should be required as part of the documentation supporting loans. It should be reviewed by examiners. Uh, Congress should also review what I call the bounty hunter mentality that now exists in the relationship between regulators in the field and the bankers over whom they have jurisdiction. President Clinton's proposed review process should be enforced to eliminate the adversarial attitude of bank regulators towards bank managements. The cost of regulation should be reviewed to determine whether they are so high as to be counterproductive. Banks with high regulatory costs, high capital requirements may have difficulty in generating earnings in its core lending business sufficient to maintain capital ratios and to build capital further. Loans to business, I believe, will increase more rapidly as economic con uh, growth continues but some of it may come from non-bank sources because of the problems of the banks. This is not the first time, incidentally, that trauma has changed the banking business. The double-digit interest rates that created huge losses on the books of banks during the Carter years from 1979 to 1981 introduced permanent and sweeping changes in interest rate risk management in all financial institutions. And I only mention it in closing because the shift in risk management actually caused banks to give up significant earnings to the marketplace as they, as they matched the maturity of assets and liabilities and hedged interest rate risks further. It was, an, it was a self-purchased insurance policy. And as banks uh, gave up re interest rate uh, risk, they took on more credit risk. And this was recognized by many observers of the banking industry as far back as the early 1980s that this w was likely to take place. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Olson. Ms. Pope, what I think I'll propose to do is that I'll give the uh, members of the panel who have sponsored these two witnesses the opportunity to ask questions first, so I'll turn to Mr. Rush first and then to Mr. Shays. Mr. Rush. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Olson, the uh, bounty hunter mentality that you spoke of uh, earlier, mm -hmm. uh, this, I, I've heard banks, bankers in my district in, in the city of Chicago, they've uh, talked most uh, vividly about 
this type of mentality between the regulators and, and, and the banks themselves, especially as it relates to community reinvestment, the Community Reinvestment Act, the CRA requirements, they've indicated that our regulators are looking for quantity, not quality, that they're looking for forms and not loans. Uh, they're looking for reports of any uh, frivolous activity. Most of it is frivolous between uh, the banking institutions and the, uh, and the regulators. Can you address that a little, little bit more, particularly as it relates to um, CRA? Do you think that there is a legitimate uh, bounty hunter relationship uh, that uh, regulators have as, a, as, they relate, as it relates to uh, looking at banks' CRE uh, provisions and programs? Uh, yes, if I understand your question correctly, the, uh, the regulators have... Uh, I, I, there's been a great deal written about this. Some of it was in the Wall Street Journal recently in an article entitled Regulators from Hell, which you may have seen, so I won't go into the details of that, and I, and I can tell my share of anecdotes, too. But the point that you're asking uh, is that if you instill this kind of fear in banks, in, ba in bank managements, rather, there's no question but that it's, it's going to filter down through the organization in such a way as to reduce risk-taking. And, and, and banking is, the whole, uh, banking has to do with risk management. And, and as it filters down, uh, then lending officers throughout the institution are not going to take on any loans which they feel are risky. Now, I want to add a footnote to this. Some years ago, in the late part of the, it was the early 1970s, there was a, a member of this house from, I think he was from Texas, Wright Patman, who criticized the banks because they didn't have enough losses. Because, and he said that for this reason, they were not taking on enough risk. And he had a point in that regard. Now, if you, if you reverse that now and you say you've had too many losses, you're clearly going to get a restraint on lending in that area where probably lending is needed the most, where there is great risk. That's in small business. It's in the CRA area. There's no question about it. And that, that, that activity will be hit harder, in fact, than, uh, than obviously uh, uh, some uh, other lending areas of the bank. Mm -hmm. Do you think that by uh, lessening the adversarial mentality, the uh, bounty hunter mentality, that that would uh, have the effect of, of uh, creating uh, a better flow of, of loans to CRA uh, Defined yeah. communities. I, I definitely think it will. What exists now, when I that, that in terms of that bounty hunter expression that I'm using, is that, and, and President Clinton is endeavoring to address this also, is that the the bank management in the field who has to face a field agent that has responsibility for that particular bank, has no uh, has no uh, opportunity to appeal to that agent's uh, uh, senior senior uh, officer, uh, big, and, and all the way up through the system, no one wants to interfere with the, with the field agent's dealings with that bank for fear of subsequently being criticized for having done something improper in that regard. So there's no review process. And, and, and when you have no appeal or no review process taking place, then you create an, an, an environment in which you can have abuse with regards to carrying that intimidation too far and therefore impeding the extension of normal credit and particularly impeding credit in, in, uh, in areas where there is high risk. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Pope, Connie, if I might, is, is, that, is that all right? Uh, Connie, um, you've indicated uh, <clears throat> that well, Mr. Olson said something that I've talked uh, about quite often, and I'm sure you share this, this opinion also, uh, this fact rather, that small businesses and medium-sized businesses serve to employ majority of American people. 
That's a given. In central city areas, in minority areas, minority communities, there is more serious unemployment problems, much more serious unemployment problems. I mean, at, the, at a depression level, simply because there are lack of small businesses. Mm -hmm. There uh, is a relationship between the lack of small businesses, and I remember you so vividly uh, about a year or so ago, we had a discussion about whether, the, whether minorities wanted to go into business or whether, they, whether minorities could go into businesses because of the lack of, of loans. Can you more vividly uh, give us some, get this committee some indication of the problem in terms of minorities having an opportunity to get loans, to go into business. And you're, do you process, you process, or uh, not process applications, but in fact, you do have, uh, you work with a we lot assist, of. We assist with helping to develop business plans to help walk through the quagmire paperwork, not just at the bank, but most often with the Small Business Administration because mm -hmm. that's often a requirement that uh, a bank will do a loan that we're recommending if SBA will provide a guarantee mm -hmm. uh, or the paperwork that may be associated with one or another of our local state or, or, or uh, city uh, bank financing program. So we're, we're very much involved in providing that kind of assistance to the uh, entrepreneur who is seeking financing. Um, often the entrepreneur, usually the entrepreneur, knows the product, knows the particular service. And we're going to see a lot more of this as we have seen, particularly in our community, the downsizing of large corporations and the um, interest in people who are walking out of, uh, not walking out, but being <laughs> right-sized out of their jobs into becoming more entrepreneurial, becoming uh, a, a source of uh, supply of service and goods to uh, those former businesses. They're going to be in service areas, however, and they're going to be in emerging technical areas. Um, the emerging businesses are going to be in healthcare areas. They're going to be in areas that tend to um, be fairly new to everyone so that everybody's still learning. And we know that our bankers have some difficulty, as it is, in lending in areas that they don't know too well. And now there are whole new industries that, that they won't know too well. So there is always a need to provide those kinds of supports to help business do business's job, which is to provide goods and services and in that process to create uh, an expanding job base, and you're absolutely right. That's a critical need in, in uh, our communities. And what is particularly, I think, gratifying to me is that there's some potential we're seeing uh, in, in some of these new areas to expand even more entry-level new kinds of jobs, but more of the entry-level types, while we are also looking at uh, the need for more technical skills uh, as well. But the, the flow of capital, the lifeblood of the business, is the bottom line, and whether those things happen or not. Sure. On a year, or say, uh, on an annual basis, approximately how many clients, customers, uh, cases did you, do you do uh, community, I mean, the um, cosmic violence and chain of commerce deal we, with? We touch in one way or another at least a thousand folks a year. About a but thousand a year. We and are working, I would say, uh, uh, loan clients, we're looking at a, first of all, a declining number and I could say five years ago that was three or four hundred folks coming through our organization is, and keeping in mind that there are other organizations in our community uh, seeing an equal number. But last year, that number was down to less than 100, and the actual number of deals that were uh, completed were, were completed, were approved, um, were less than 30. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, for the first time, we saw more because we work a lot with women-owned businesses as well, we actually saw more women-owned businesses, non-minority, um, in terms of dollar approvals for loans than we did 
minority owned. Okay. What impact uh, does, uh, would the CIA, uh, well, let me just rephrase this. <clears throat> right now, CRA doesn't cover commercial loans. And, uh, extending provisions of CRA to cover commercial loans, would that have a positive or a negative effect in your If, in fact, and this is what we've discussed with our banks, if, in fact, those businesses are truly bankable. But our, our banks have asked us to bring deals to them, but they have asked that they be good deals. And the definition today of what is a good deal is, is different from what it, it used to be. Um, even the Small Business Administration's requirements we've seen change over the years. And you know I've been doing this for over 20 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Pope, I would love you to comment on, on the comment you made in your, sp in your presentation. You said during the past decade we have seen, however, a survival of the fittest mentality at work in government which no longer wish to serve as a catalyst supporting the growth of our job base through smaller business development. What is the, um, can you put that in some context for me? Because it seems to me uh, we do want the survivors, uh, the, the fittest to survive. Mm -hmm. What concerns me about this uh, credit crunch is that those who are even fit aren't surviving. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could just kind of put in some context how you mean this. It, it's a referral back to a time when there were networks, um, there were underpinnings for not just business. We I have seen this in other areas as well. Jobs training and is another one that uh, we're extremely concerned, concerned about in terms of the changes that have taken place in the way that government supports the efforts in the community to to have some impact on its own economy. Um, so that at its, there was a time when through the Department of Commerce, through uh, Housing and Urban Development, uh, through a variety of ways that agencies, government agencies impacted on the community, there were resources available to support the development of small business as these kinds of um, <laughs> efforts were being made, like the development and growth right. of small businesses within the community, it which is really important, excuse me, in, yes. in, in a city like Chicago where we see so much of our business, established business, tend to shift away from where the job base is and out side of the perimeters of the city for a whole variety of reasons yes. that we don't need to get into, that there needs to be a continuing d flow and development of businesses that are located within the city and the support for those businesses is not there. When, when um, I've always viewed uh, loans to small businesses and outreach to minority owned small businesses as not being loans uh, given to people who can't survive and individuals, but basically loans given to people who don't have the resources, but if given a chance, could prove to be very fit. And I guess the, the, what I'm interested, I shouldn't take from your statement that, uh, or, or should I, uh, am I incorrect in making the assumption that what we're trying to do in government for small business, particularly minority-owned small business, is to give um, individuals who don't have necessarily the resources or maybe even some of the uh, of the historic uh, success rate uh, giving them an opportunity but if if we do that we'll, we'll find that they w are in fact very fit and able to survive I, I think uh, the question that congressman rush asked me about the numbers of people we see mm -hmm. see we see uh, a huge number of people mm -hmm. go through particularly our education and, and training programs um, many of those people discover, <coughs> excuse me, in that process that it is, this is not a good time for them to become business owners. They are not yeah. um, potential entrepreneurs. So that, and we consider that a service as much as that service we provide to those. So, no, I'm talking about people with potential. I'm talking with people with good, as I said in my statement, people who have, there's clearly a market potential yes. for their business. We're not interested in trying to help someone to fail uh, who, who couldn't succeed without the given. It seems to me then yeah. that your survival of the fit, fittest analogy really is applying to the fact that 
uh, that they that we look we're looking at people with the best track records in the past and not necessarily the best it, potential it, in the future. It refers to expecting that everyone can make it on his or her own uh, efforts without any supports available. And I think we know in the history of this country that there have been all kinds of supports provided to all kinds of industries and businesses as, as a way to keep the country competitive and keep various businesses and industry competitive. You, you gave it what, was a, what I thought was an astounding low statistic, unless I heard you incorrectly, of the number of, of minority-owned businesses in this country. It's astounding to all of us. It yeah. is frightening. To, yeah. You said minority? Yes. or African American. African American. African American. Yeah. What was the what was that? We're looking at 0.5 percent, half of not, one. Not not five percent, but 0.5 percent. Half of one percent. Yeah. We have had we have seen a decline yeah. in the relationship, the proportionate relationship between our businesses and uh, all businesses in, in America, yeah. and it's frightening us as well. I, I, I did not realize how low it was, and I appreciate you, you know, pointing that out again. Mm -hmm. Mr. Olson, as always, it's uh, it's really a pleasure to have you talk about this issue and so many others. I'm, uh, I'm struck with a number of reactions. One is uh, your talk of the economy growing and, and loans, uh, and yet banks aren't e expanding their loans. Um, for that to happen, are, just, uh, are we just looking at people going to alternative sources to get capital? And I'm reminded to just say to you that I, I've been to two car dealerships who are doing very well in 4th Congressional District, and uh, both of them have had to go to alternative sources to fund their, uh, their purchase of, uh, of inventory cars. You know, that, that, that is exactly what will happen when, when the uh, traditional source of credit uh, to auto dealers, for example, or to any small business uh, is, uh, is curtailed in one way or another. Markets will develop innovations. And th what makes that significant is that the, that it, it's the market is saying the borrower is credit worthy but the traditional lender is unwilling to make the loan, so therefore the market steps forward and creates innovation in order to provide that. At now, a higher interest rate, though, it'd be, and, and it, probably it, at less. It may be at a higher interest rate, uh, and the terms may be different, and that's, that's true. But for some borrowers, uh, the, the market innovation is, is costly to find and, and, some, and, and more costly to access. And in some cases, uh, this is not perfect in each market. In some cases, in some markets, it doesn't happen at all. But it does happen. And it strikes me that some people may be able to identify those alternative sources and others may not have the That's capacity. That's precisely right. One of the things that has really struck me uh, in terms of our building of, uh, of capital re uh, reserves uh, is that in essence we told banks to call in their good loans to pay for their, to cover their bad debt. And I'm struck with the fact that if they're doing that, they're, they're simply not making money or making as much money as they could to become sounder and, and, and... Well, I think in some cases, many of the banks are not making the money in what I would call their core business. And as we know, uh, the present, uh, the present uh, uh, differential between uh, high and longer term rates and very low short term rates, the spread, as we say, has encouraged a, a great deal of security purchases by banks. And, and uh, because there's an attractive rate of return, and particularly if you're buying government securities, because there's no capital requirement for the, for the government securities. And, uh, and, and, and what, I, 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 what question I raise is that when that, uh, when that yield curve begins to straighten out and flatten out, which it must if the economy is going to recover, incidentally, if we have the, if we have the spread continuing indefinitely, it means the economy isn't recovering. It has to flatten, and when that does flatten, then the, the question is, uh, will the banks begin to realize earnings from their core business? Are they going to step forward and start to, to lend more aggressively in order to generate income from that particular source? But the bottom line is we're, we're crippling the, the, the gr potential growth of the economy, aren't we, if they're not? Well, it, we're, we're, yeah, we are crippling it to the degree that we're, we're not encouraging banks to engage in the traditional business of making loans. You and and I might add, one of the things I have in my remarks, which I would stress also, is that the cost structure of regulation and the cost structure of high capital requirements has to be reflected in the, in the rates that banks charge when they go out in the marketplace to get loans or to make loans. And in this particular environment, uh, these rates can't be very high if the borrower is, able to, is going to qualify. 
One of the um, statements you made, they said there are banks that have survived in the past five years that would have been closed if current capital ratios had been in effect, I guess, today, um, had been in effect then, what they are today. Um, if we had treated, um, if we had had these capital requirements on banks, if we had made the larger national rural banks write off their bad foreign debt, what would have been the outcome of those banks? Well, you would have had, banks would have failed. Yeah. Why is it then that no we... No question. But why is it we were unwilling to accept that then, thank goodness, and we were willing to accept it now? Well, that's a, you're asking a question that uh, I, uh, I, I, I can't answer. I, I really don't know why that was the case in, in the, uh, except one of the things I would say is that the, uh, that the uh, foreign loans, particularly to uh, Central and South America, because that's where it was concentrated, uh, involved very large banks. And uh, I know I'm speaking about a bank that I was with, in fact. It involved very large banks and the, the, uh, the, the catastrophic nature of, of, the, of that in single bank entities was so great that forbearance in the accounting area came forward. And, uh, and banks were, these loans were called non-performing loans, but they weren't forced to write them off. Uh, the, in, the, in the case of, the, of, of domestic real estate, you had com uh, uh, commercial real estate in particular, you had large numbers of smaller banks, although even the large banks, of course, have been hit by this. It isn't that they have not. But I'm not quite sure why that you had a different way of approaching, uh, uh, approaching the problem. Uh, I, I do think that, the, that some of the, the highly visible and celebrated cases of fraud and, and, uh, and gross abuse of insider dealings, uh, of which Mr. Keating is the most uh, famous, of course, tended to color the uh, the uh, the uh, the image of what was taking place in banking, and this is why I identified in my remarks here this very rapid increase in r commercial real estate lending, because there are many banks. In fact, one of the anecdotes which I didn't tell here was a bank, uh, a, a, a bank director that I know, who was sued by the FTC. Uh, there was no fraud, no insider dealing. He was charged with making what were called. Uh, uh, reckless loans, or, or, or rather loans that, were, that proved not to be sound. And the only thing he did was to not recognize in advance that the value of real estate in his state was going to drop by 50 percent. And uh, that was the only uh, crime that was uh, committed. One last question, Mr. Chairman, if I might. Certainly. Yeah. Uh, y y you point out that, uh, the, as, as you just alluded to now, the, uh, the key failure of the regulators to, uh, to notice the um, tremendous oversubscription in, in, in commercial real estate. Um, I, I'm likened to, um, to uh, think of my, my basic economics 101 class when we talked about the farming mark, uh, uh, farming and, and how farmers would, uh, would uh, see that the price was very high one year and then they would plant fields that they didn't ordinarily plant and then the next year there was an overabundance of supply and they would under farm and then there would be this real cyclical uh, nature to it is is it is it conceivable that are you basically this is my question are you basically saying that just the information to banks that uh, there's too much in uh, lending in one area would be sufficient or are you actually saying that regulators should have the right to be able to to set different reserve requirements no. quickly not re set reserve requirements but that the the regulators should require that banks provide information indicating uh, whether they took into consideration the general environment of the, of the product area, if it's a product or an industry, or like in this case is construction, did they take that into consideration as they were making individual loans? That should be a part of the, of the examination process. And incidentally, when I suggest this, I'm suggesting this not to be layered on the top of what's already going on. I'm saying that, that all of the things that have been put in here to safeguard the banks, large part of it isn't necessary if you if you understood what caused this breakdown in banking that that has just taken place I just yeah I'm sorry yeah go ahead I just make one comment then regards to that it, it, it seems to me uh, in Stanford Connecticut we knew we needed a hotel and so four uh, five different concerns built the hotel and we ended up with five hotels instead of one hotel but they all knew it you know and they still did it and I'm just wondering so it's, it's got to be more than just the knowledge. It's got to be something else that, that happens besides the knowledge. 
This is where I, the reason why I say that the examiners should require this kind of information is so that the bank managements focus on it and recognize that they will be held responsible if they make loans in the midst of a of a product, a huge product cycle that is taking place. Okay. That they should seek that kind of information. Okay, my question though is, how do we hold them responsible? What what would we basically do? Well, I, I, actually, my hope would be that uh, that they wouldn't have to be held responsible because if they were forced to focus on that kind I mean, of information, justify, you wouldn't have you wouldn't have I the hear problems you. to c hear. Uh, that would occur. And when I when I noticed and I showed you the chart that I did here, I, I could tell you that uh, as you know, my testimony. I'll go back to the Florida land boom. That this product cycle phenomenon occurs time and time again, mm -hmm. and uh, and it has happened in real estate. We had the REIT episode in the early 1970s in which banks made excessive uh, uh, loans in, in uh, real estate investment trusts at that time also and produced excessive construction, excessive product. Gotcha. Thank you very much. And I again thank the chairman for inviting both witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Shays. And Mr. Cox? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to address this question both to Ms. Pope and to Mr. Olson, and you can answer it uh, uh, in either order, whichever of you decides uh, uh, you want to speak up first. Uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, allude to testimony that you both gave uh, in Ms. Pope's case concerning the Community Reinvestment Act, uh, in Mr. Olson's case, the general uh, uh, problem of the cost of regulation. Uh, Ms. Pope, I was particularly uh, uh, concerned in reading the comments of bankers that you quoted in your testimony, and you've pledged yourself in support of the goals of the Community Reinvestment Act, which I certainly share, uh, and yet we see that in practice uh, uh, the increase in regulation, which is a particular burden for small banks, may be directly counterproductive uh, from the goal that we're trying to achieve. Uh, Mr. Olson, you gave uh, some very persuasive numbers in your testimony. Uh, the cost of regulatory requirements may range as high as 14 percent of commercial banks' non-interest expense. Uh, which runs over $18 billion, uh, and that compares to uh, banks' earnings last year of about $32 billion. So really over half <coughs> of banks' earnings uh, are uh, consumed in the cost of regulation. Uh, the, the question I'll put to both of you, uh, Ms. Pope, in the context of the CRA and Mr. Olson in the context of anything you choose, uh, what can we do uh, in Congress uh, to uh, reduce regulation uh, rather than constantly increase it so that in particular uh, loans to small business uh, can increase? We think that the aims and purposes of the Community Reinvestment Act are, are clear and important. We need dollars to stay within the community and we need them to flow properly through the community. And the Community Reinvestment Act is one of the ways that happens. What happens, however, is that in the context of all of the other kinds of regulatory requirements, it becomes kind of like one more thing. And perhaps for some bankers, uh, in our community anyway, it's felt like a straw that breaks the camel's back. That without the other kinds of issues, it, it really it becomes a, a contradiction of terms almost to respond to the credit needs of your community on the one hand and on the other hand. And by the way, we're all sensitive to the fact that while CRA has not been specific about commercial lending uh, prior to this time, that there's been a growing demand for it to look at small business lending in, in the communities and that there is a definite moving, movement uh, to uh, strengthen that in, in the act itself. Um, but the to, to put on top of uh, all of the other kinds of requirements, the Community Reinvestment Act requirements, then is, is what has begun to, to the banks to say that, you know, this is just the final straw, this is too much. We would prefer to see some of those requirements because we're talking now about developing relationships. We're talking about the bank and the communities that they're in having relationships and that lending begins or, or goes back to being done in, in the context of those relationships. We're not talking about um, simply any risky deal that comes through the door. In fact, we go out and meet with the lending divisions, every all the loan officers of our member banks. We ask them to come together and with our staff talk about what 
they're looking for in the community, what they think uh, is the best kind. We have some banks that in their communities, it is not practical for them necessarily to do more franchises. In other situations, they're saying, well, you know, bring us good deals, but don't bring us construction companies. And we're getting that to know the needs of, of the banks and the needs of the community, and they are getting to know those things too. And, and it's out of those, that kind of relationship building that we ought to be able to do more sound business deals that go to the heart of uh, what are the market realities of business, doing business in a community and therefore how we make this a win-win situation for everybody, the banker, the business, and the community itself. Thank you, Mr. Olson. Well, I, uh, I recognize that <clears throat> that when, we, when the wave of bank failures began to sweep through the 1980s, that uh, uh, Congress and the regulators, uh, uh, through hearings then also, uh, I tried to identify what, was, what had caused these loans, these losses to take place. This is one of the reasons I focused on the omission of recognizing the lack of information on the surge in real estate lending. Uh, in the process of doing that, Every weakness that seemed to appear in a given bank uh, was, uh, was identified as a need for a document or some form of regulation. While that particular weakness in that, s in that single instance was probably not fatal to that bank in any way whatsoever. I've likened it a little bit to the fire that destroyed a large number of homes out in Oakland, California a couple of years ago that uh, regulators would look at that and say the reason why the house burned down was there was no fire door between the garage and the house. <laughs> well, that's the kind of thing that has crept into some of the regulation that has been put in here, and it's simply excessive, and, and, it, and, and it's costly. And, and I think that a review of that, and particularly as you deal with regulators, if you're going to have some of them come back again in these hearings again, is to ask them to take a look and see, was, are, were they really fatal to a large number of banks, or was this just a random event that may have occurred in a few banks where there was that particular weakness. The other, which is rather extreme, but I have said this in, in the past in, in, in testimony before Congress before, that bank regulatory agencies or any regulatory agency of government tends to treat the demand for information as a free good. In other words, the bank regulatory agencies do not bear the burden of the cost of providing this information. And as long as they treat it as a free good, they will ask for everything they can get, and particularly after the kind of events that they've just gone through, which has been a trauma for the regulators as much as it has been for the bank managements, and therefore has led to excessive regulation. Well, I will undertake to both of our witnesses uh, that if you care to follow up with specific recommendations concerning regulations or detail within regulations that can be eliminated, paperwork demands that can be eliminated, and so on, that I'll move forward on it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Zellick. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is for both of you. Uh, you you uh, mentioned, Mr. Olson, uh, a lot of your testimony is devoted to excess real estate lending and uh, financial disturbances of the last 12 years. Uh, maybe you could comment on the uh, tax law or uh, the tax acts uh, that were also uh, passed during that 12 year period and what effect it, that you uh, may have seen has taken place uh, on lending and some of the problems that we now have I, uh, I'd like to divide it into two parts I recognize that the 1968 act made changes regarding passive income and passive losses couldn't be deducted from earned income and, and there are many who feel that that began, that, that exacerbated the problems in real estate. And it, well, it would at a, when, when you'd reached a point where you had a significant amount of ex, excess capacity, excess space already produced. I, I feel that any time we have tax laws which en encourage unwise investment, excessive investment only because of the tax considerations, that when the tax laws and the tax considerations are dominant in those decision making, it leads to problems in the economy. And clearly the laws 
uh, the laws encouraged excessive investment in real estate and as a consequence excessive construction. Mrs. Pope. Okay. Well, the tax issues are not something that we've taken a hard look at, but I am prepared to defer to Mr. Olson's comments. It's, I, I think that's an important on, uh, answer. President uh, Clinton's <laughs> initiatives on uh, character lending, um, have you seen any, uh, any changes all, at all, either of you, in the regulatory process in the last, say, four to six weeks? I think it's too soon. That is one I am prepared to, to comment on. We're very glad to see that. Uh, we have had some specific situations that uh, have been unnerving to us. We. Uh, again, as an organization of businesses, um, do not like to see any, we, we try to stay out of the competitive competition within, uh, among members of our organization, but we have seen situations where there's an existing banking relationship, a line of credit that needed to be ex expanded, and we've seen this happen uh, twice in the last, if not four weeks, but certainly in the last several months where we've literally uh, not been able to expand lines of credit as the business has been growing and the demands for those businesses have been growing, receivables have been growing, uh, and that business has become kind of uh, easy pickings for another bank that might be trying to meet its uh, CRA requirements to look good when it uh, undergoes a, an, uh, a, an examination, and um, seeing solid business relations disrupted that way uh, is a bit unnerving and unnecessary. We'd rather bring new business into each of our member banks than to see them pick off the best from, from one another. And we're afraid that, that that's one of the uh, fallouts of the regulations that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. I'm not in a position where I would uh, early detect this. Uh, okay. I, I'm looking forward to testimony from uh, the next panel to see if there's any indication as, as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Pope, let me ask you, have you seen, since you've been at this and your Chamber of Commerce has been at it for some years, have you seen a, a noticeable and dramatic change in the extension of credit, both in the quality of, uh, qualitatively and quantitatively over the last two to three years? Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it has just been... Um, very dis distressing. We don't, it, it initially did not understand it until we began to see uh, and hear from our bankers uh, what was driving the kinds of decisions that they were beginning to make. There was, uh, we've, we've been seeing a shift. And are they telling from. you that if they make a certain loan to a certain borrower based on certain collateral, that it's likely to be classified as substandard? Do you Absolutely. frequently hear that the examiners of the... They have been, t they have, they've had that experience of businesses that have been paying, the loans are current, relationships have been there, but the loans have been declared on substandard because the documentation was not in order when the examiners went through the records. Are the banks generally much more insistent on a demonstrable cash flow to support the repayment of the loan than they have been in the past? Absolutely. So all of these things are manifesting themselves Absolutely. in the customers that you're bringing and, forth. And we are not, as I, I keep repeating, we're not suggesting that they shouldn't be looking for the answer to how is this loan going to be paid back? And that's just a, a legitimate question when the bank, the, the, the deal comes through the door. But there ought to be uh, reasonable room. There ought to be flexibility. Uh, there ought to be more than um, someone from far away trying to determine what makes good sense in a local community for a local business and a local bank. A CRA, Community Reinvestment, ought to give you a chit to play. You ought to be able to go to these banks and say the examiners are coming and when they come either for a compliance exam or a routine review of your books, They'll be asking you questions about community reinvestment. Here are some potential loan applications that would give you a response to the examiners when they ask the question. Does that buy you any grace or any uh, entree with the we, banks you we approach? Have, we have had, we've had relationships that have developed as a result of CRA. Not only our reaching out to the banks, but they're reaching out to us. 
again, that was what initiated our bank programs, a simple name for what we consider to be a, a, a very special way to bridge the relationship between business and banks. Uh, did you experience any sort of regression in the sense that due to the new capital standards, borrowers who had established lines of credit in the past were having these lines summarily terminated by the bank? Terminated or certainly not extended when not they extended. needed to be extended. Yeah. But we've also seen terminations as well. We've seen, we've, we have seen and, you know, this has been a real strange phenomenon. Uh, banks simply uh, invite customers not to be their customers anymore. Let me ask you, Mr. Mr. Olson, if, if you perceive this nationwide, you're in the forecasting business, is it uh, varying from region to region differently? And is this a credit crunch that uh, applies to everyone, or does it particularly afflict small and medium-sized businesses, or does it particularly afflict certain regions of the country where well, there have been lots of failures? It has clearly affected various regions of the country uh, in different ways. We know that the New England area was, aff uh, was afflicted more severely than perhaps others, but California has also been sharply affected by this, and it's also been in some, some of the southwestern uh, states as well. Uh, I maintain that part of, part of the, the reason why you have differences is because, once again, I go back to my real estate numbers, that uh, where you had uh, a high volume of, of lending taking place early in the, in the cycle and, and banks managed to put on their books a large amount of completed projects that were income producing before the bubble burst, were, were better off or have been better off for some time here than those banks who put loans on their books towards the end of the cycle and those those projects were coming onto the market at a time when it would became clearly evident that uh, there was there was no demand for them uh, those those banks had disproportionate amount of bad loans and therefore they would be affected to a greater degree so that the new england area to the degree that commercial real estate played a role and it did play a major role was due to that the, the timing of the particular cycle and how it affected real estate that was being produced at that particular time. Now, uh, the, uh, the, we, we know that, the, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that the uh, weaker banking areas, such as New England, have, uh, therefore, less lending taking place. Uh, those banks are trying to repair their capital further. And, uh, and, and they can't grow their assets very aggressively, particularly those that are subject to capital requirements. Uh, when, when they are trying to maintain or to increase their capital further. And so it, it has to have an impact on the availability of credit through those traditional lending sources. Just on that particular point, I think it's a little ironic that one of your proposals is that we do stiffen the regulation or stiffen the oversight when it comes to the content of appraisals or the content of the uh, bank's own assessment of uh, commercial real estate collateral. But any good appraisal, commercial appraisal, that's worth the fee you pay for it, is going to include an assessment of the existing stock of commercial real estate of that kind and the absorption rate, the rate at which the market will take up new units added to the market. You don't have a section in the appraisal that deals with that in a commercial real estate appraisal. It's, that's it's right. Not, it's but most, most of those real estate appraisals are an extrapolation. And when, when, when the bubble breaks, you know, that appraisal is not going to be so timely that it's going to catch that particular decline. And, and, and I, I might add that the reason why I'm recommending, in fact, that, that this kind of information be, in, uh, be required in both by the banks and in, in the examination is because this has happened again and again. It's what we call a product cycle. I saw it, we saw it happen in, 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 I mentioned snowmobiles before. I've seen it happen in real estate. I've seen it happen in other product areas. It's a cy product cycle that happens again and again. And, uh, and a particular lending area becomes hot and, uh, and, and banks move into it. It was, it was the same thing that happened in uh, Central and South America. Uh, in fact, that uh, uh, banks, Citibank has had a presence, for example, in, uh, in, in Mexico since before the turn of the century. They have a business, they have, they have a, a, a facility there, they have uh, lending offices that go around trying to get business all the time, and all of a sudden in the summer of 1982, doors began to open and they started making loans, and for a critical period of some five or six months, they thought they were increasing their share of market. 
because the other banks weren't telling them that they also were, were increasing their share market at the same time, and the total was, incre was increasing. And what you were getting was taking down of, of dollar loans and then a capital flight out of Mexico because they recognized that the exchange rate was, was, uh, was, out, was out of kilter. And, and after that event, the banks got together to form some kind of an information base that would enable them to get information from a private source without revealing the confidentiality of the, of the lending of each institution, what was happening in that particular market. That's how critical it was to, in that particular episode. And that's why I maintain it. And I, I don't see it anywhere in any of the testimony by regulators of recognizing this, what I call a product cycle phenomenon that has accounted for more losses in banking than, than, uh, than the, the, what I call the, the, the lack of a, a proper appraisal, for example, or some incidental documentation. If that had been the cause, you would have had random failures. You didn't have random failures. You had wholesale failures throughout whole regions and states. You've spoken of adversarial attitudes, bounty hunters, the fear of reprisal. If you were the comptroller of the currency, if you were the chairman of the Fed, what would you do to correct those attitudes? I would follow up on President Clinton's recommendation and I would enforce it, namely to provide a, a formal method by which banks could appeal up the line of responsibility in the same way that you can do in the tax courts today. That is not, has not been available to bankers. Bankers have been at the mercy of the field agent in many instances. You would communicate to the field by telling the field that they could be bypassed. Uh, bypassed, absolutely. And this is where you have to take on responsibility. Because, the, because, of what, because of the Keating affair, no one has wanted to intervene on what may appear to be to listen to the complaint of a banker because you're afraid that there'll be a political reprisal on this. And for that reason, it has set up this mentality that I call a bounty hunting mentality where there is no, re there is no appeal process in place. And this is for items that are classified or for other uh, yes. items for which banks are docked in the course of examinations, yes. compliance examinations and regular financial examinations. Well, we'd welcome any other specific recommendations either one of you would like to make, as Mr. Cox said, because we're trying to compile things that will work and will have an impact on loosening up and thawing out this crunch. Thank you very much for coming and testifying. Yeah, Mr. Rush has one further question. Mr. Chairman, I want to ask uh, one additional question from each of the witnesses, if I might uh, only take a moment. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Olson, this morning, uh, the news of uh, some news accounts uh, indicated uh, that the chairman of the House Banking Committee made some remarks that were critical of the chairman of the SD FDIC. Are you aware of those remarks? No, I'm not, no. Uh, he indicated that there were, that the FDIC withdrew the money supply and therefore it had a, uh, had a, uh, negative effect on job creation, if you're not aware of this statement. Is it, was, this the, the, uh, was this critical of the Federal Reserve or the FDIC? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, Federal Reserve. I'm Federal sorry. Reserve, yes. Federal Reserve, right. Are you, you aware of that statement? Uh, no, but I'm not, I'm not surprised by it. Do you have a... Uh, okay, would you elaborate upon your... <laughs> yes, I, in fact, I welcome your question because as we were, were winding down, there was one thing I did want to say. It is reflected in my, my prepared statement, but the the uh, uh, the economic policy agencies, namely in fiscal and monetary policy, and for Federal Reserve particularly in monetary policy, has a significant responsibility with regards to creating the kind of an environment in which bank managements and businesses across the tr country endeavor to 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 uh, to manage. And uh, there, <clears throat> we in the, in the 19 latter part of the 1970s, the early 1980s, they created an absolutely chaotic, impossible environment that that uh, that drove interest rates to extraordinarily high levels. It was a mistake in policy making that was uh, taken out at that, uh, undertaken at that particular time. It also contributed substantially to the weakening of banks and, and uh, in particularly thrift institutions, which carried forward into the 1980s. Uh, commercial banks uh, changed their risk management. As a matter of fact, when, when I left Citibank, I, uh, I spoke to the chief financial officer of the bank and I said, you know, we're incurring an opportunity cost when we match li uh, the maturities of assets and liabilities. The whole, the whole business of banking 
is to borrow short and lend long. That is the business of banking, and it always has been, down through the centuries. And when they started to match maturities, they started to give up income to the marketplace. When they started to hedge uh, all of their interest rate risks, they were giving up income to the, to the to marketplace. But after the trauma they had gone through, as a consequence of the monetary policy mistakes of that time, they, they undertook to do that. They became self-insurers. And I said, you should ask yourself, what is the price of this insurance policy you're buying? In terms of what kind of an under, uh, opportunity cost? I don't believe it was ever, that kind of an analysis was ever done. But, but I know that banks across the country gave up a great deal of earnings during the 1980s, and that's why I say that in, in guarding against interest rates, they took on credit risks in order to try to compensate for that particular. The, the, uh, the, the, the Federal Reserve, you, you, ha you have to recognize that, 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 uh, that the economic environment changes in response to policies and in, a, in response to monetary policies, and those changes in, in the economic environment can have major effect on what is regarded as a good loan or a bad loan. All through the testimony that's been presented to you here from the regulators, I noticed they said banks should be encouraged to make loans to creditworthy borrowers. Well, a creditworthy borrower is in the eyes of the beholder. A creditworthy borrower today may be a very bad loan and a very risky loan two or three years from now. That's a matter of individual judgment. And the quality of that loan can become very, very poor in a matter of three or four years if monetary policy isn't conducted uh, appropriately during that time. And Ms. Ms. Pope, let me just ask you one final question. You, uh, I noticed a couple of times in your testimony you indicated uh, about uh, the labor-intensive uh, businesses, uh, construction uh, companies and things like that. and, and um, that uh, there was a real, uh, very, very difficult uh, challenge that they, f that they faced in terms of getting loans. And I'm particularly interested in one aspect of that, and that's as it relates to performance bonds, which I also <laughs> believe is a part of, of the uh, overall credit crunch uh, that exists. Absolutely. Uh, can you uh, just uh, briefly just summarize your, your experience in terms of uh, your member organizations, your member businesses, uh, their inability or their ability to, to get performance bonds and what type of impact what does that have? Thank you. There have been a number of efforts and they're continuing to be. We at National Business League are uh, working right now to structure a new bonding program that would be targeted to inner city con construction companies in inner cities. Um, while we know this industry has certainly suffered severely in recent years and in our community that's no different, we also know that local communities have um, gone to public works, have established what we refer to in Chicago as the mega projects, the opportunity projects that have helped to keep the industry afloat and have great potential not just for um, the industry at large, but for minority businesses, small businesses, and even businesses entering the, the industry. Performance bonds are tied to essentially financial um, stability, the financial capability to complete successfully a, a project so that the bond alone, and we can create all kinds of um, bonding programs targeted to one or another kind of project or one or another kind of uh, construction contractor, but without the financial wherewithal, that financial stability um, and capability to perform, then the bond is, is, is the bonding programs are useless and, and, and meaningless. They have to go hand in hand with our ability to access cap capital. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I just want to say that uh, I, the, I like the uh, committee to recognize Mr. Ulysses Maynard, who's also from the city of Chicago, and he's here also in the, in the audience. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, we have a little, uh, thank you very much both for coming. We benefited from your testimony. We appreciate uh, very much indeed your willingness to take the time and effort to come here and present your views to us. We want to thank you for your interest in, thank you. and hard work. Thank yes, you. indeed. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. Same time. The next panel is Mr. Christopher C. Gallagher, Gallagher, Callahan, and Gartrell.
who is appearing here on behalf of the New Hampshire Bankers Association. He's from Concord, New Hampshire. Mr. Gallagher, welcome. And Mr. Joseph H. Frampton, President and CEO of the Paducah Bank and Trust Company of Paducah, Kentucky, on behalf of the Kentucky Bankers Association. Mr. Frampton, welcome to you also, sir. Both of you have submitted testimony, I believe, and we will make your prepared and submitted testimony part of the record so that you can summarize it as you see fit. Uh, Mr. Gallo, would you like to proceed first? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank you and the members of the committee for inviting me to appear here today. I'd particularly like to publicly thank uh, Congressman Zeller for the work that he's done in New Hampshire. Things are pretty bad off in New Hampshire and have been for some time, but they'd be a good deal worse were it not for his relentless efforts to try and get the Congress and try and get the rest of Washington to understand our plight. Uh, I have submitted written testimony, as you know, and in that testimony I made a pretty strong case for, se for several propositions that I'll simply summarize in the interest of time. I would add that I cite the Peake and Rosengren study, as you did, Mr. Chairman, uh, in my testimony. Uh, I commend that to all of you uh, simply because it gets to the basic issue uh, of the credit crunch, and it does so in a way that is demonstrably and objectively uh, supportable. And that's what people have been looking for, I think, here in Congress. The fact of the matter is a lot of people are intimidated by this issue. And what it's really, what's really going on is a behavioral process that's perfectly understandable by anyone who's ever run for public office. And I think if you look at it in that light, supported by the Peake and Rosengren type figures, you'll be able to understand what's going on. Credit crunch is a process. It's not a term for tight money. It's not a term for regulatory burden. It is a constriction on business lending caused by actual or expected regional demand for more banking capital and reserves at a time when a regional economy is in a downswing and capital ratios can be improved only by shrinking banking assets, especially those assets most likely to be classified. Through FDICIA, Credit Crunch is now built into our statutory and regulatory system. And like a computer virus, its repressive measures are programmed to be activated by the first sign of weakness in any individual bank or in any region's economy. Academics call the process differential regulation, but in practice, it is both, predator it is both predatory and pro-cyclical. It preys on the weak, and it makes a bad regional economy worse. That's the universal essence of the credit crunch. Credit crunch is a process, and you'll see it, it laid out in some detail in my written testimony, is designed to close down, limit the capital of weak banks or weak areas, uh, at the, the banks of these areas, I mean, uh, by demanding more capital, demanding more loan loss reserves, obviously that makes matters worse for business. And that's, that's what it is. So while structural banking problems are well understood, behavioral banking problems are not. If Congress establishes a regulatory regime, regime that presumes that bankers are not trustworthy, that punishes the assumption of risk, and threatens to close active commercial lenders if their area's economy falters, bankers will not make risky loans. All business loans involve such risk, especially loans to small and medium-sized businesses. Thus, the bankers' incented behavior leads to loss of credit and loss of needed jobs in those businesses. Now, the administration has made it clear that even if severe regulatory constraints designed to minimize risk were once justified, our nation now needs more active bank lending in order to restore needed credit to bank-dependent businesses. Congress is not about to repeal FDICIA. It still wants FDICIA's risk protection and early intervention mechanisms. But if Congress is going to keep FDICIA, it should at least stop urging regulators to use their FDICIA-based discretion in a repressive manner. If this country is to get back on its feet, it needs small and medium-sized business to operate and expand. These firms need credit, credit that they will not obtain as long as bankers are afraid to hold business loans in their portfolio because bankers view regulators as potential instruments of repressive congressional policy. The administration's March 10 initiatives, therefore, may not seem to be significant 
to some, but if that message, message, if, if just the message alone were reinforced by Congress rather than being clouded by conflicting signals, the regulators could confidently move ahead, rendering the credit crunch a part of our history instead of a part of our statutory system. Now this is your last hearing on this issue, and I'd like to just take a minute or two to approach this issue from the point of view not of an advocate trying to save New England or an advocate trying to help the bankers recover, uh, but to s recognize that we all, Congress, the regulators, the bankers, the public, uh, seek to remedy the wrongs of the past while we restore this regulatory balance that we know we need for the future. So I'll use my remaining time to step above the fray and to offer a fresh perspective and to see what might be done to get us back to where we all want and need to be, where lenders make loans, regulators monitor the system, and Congress concentrates on the macro management of an economic system that clearly needs its full attention. Let's start with the Congress. Putting cause and blame aside, in 1989, Congress was confronted with a financial institution's disaster. Folks who elected them didn't know the difference between a bank and an SNL and didn't care about regulators. Someone had made a big mistake and people looked at their elected officials for a solution. Not surprisingly, members of Congress believe that they have the right to expect bankers to be trustworthy and to expect regulators to carefully monitor the bank insurance fund and bank behavior. And in 1989, the Congress felt let down. Worse, even though the banks were self-insured, Congress then feared that there were not enough reserves to cover projected losses, and worse, if bank premiums were raised to match the risk, it might even put more banks out of business. So naturally, Congress acted strongly. It acted to reduce risk exposure to the bank insurance fund. It acted to make the banks assume more of their own risk and to expressly tell the regulators how to do their job. And that's what fiducia is. But on the other hand, in 1990, bankers believed that they were getting a bum rap. Not only because they felt their paid up premiums covered the risk, but because they were not the SNLs. And while there may have been some bad apples in banking, they were not enough to spoil the entire bushel. Bankers were competing with unregulated competition. They were paying for the sins of others, and Fiducia was enacted to micromanage their business and treat them as though they couldn't be trusted. But the fact is, one way or another, bankers had lost the trust of Congress. And once trust is lost, it's not only hard to win back, the void it leaves behind will invariably be filled with suspicions, rules, and closer supervision. Lack of trust produced fiducia. Fiducia will stay put at least until that trust is restored. As for the regulators, they are still caught in the middle. When banking became a political issue, they felt like policy pawns, pushed and pulled in every direction by political currents within the beltway. Bank examiners saw their workload triple, had their reliability, competence, and good faith questioned, and felt like scapegoats for everybody else's mistakes. Fiducia is a symptom. The disease in the system right now is the absence of trust. We must mutually restore that sense of trust that lets the system operate and soon. Credit jo crunch job one is to work together to that end. The SNL crisis will pass. The BIF is now actuarially sound. We have some breathing room and must do everything we can to restore the belief in Congress that our bank regulators and our banks are ready and able to do their jobs without such close supervision. The regulators must take back their roles as monitors and not managers, and banks must show that they have learned to manage risk responsibly. Then Congress will be able to back away from some of Fiducia's more onerous directives. So how do we restore this trust? Well, first, the administration must appoint people with integrity, understanding, leadership, and sensitivity to the feelings and forces at work here. The appointment of Gene Ludwig as comptroller clearly fits that description. The regulators must reestablish their balanced independence by returning balanced impartiality to the process and in so doing establish predictability for lenders and earn again the respect of Congress. And Congress itself must look ahead, not back, confirm only those they feel they can one day rely upon and let them do the job they need to do. When that happens, we can begin to move forward to the point where mutual trust can be the credit 
can be the predicate for a new system that both incorporates the lessons we have learned and sets aside those strictures standing in the place of trust that also now stand in the place of lending and stand in the way of lending. What happened with Fiducia was it encodified a regulatory process that had already occurred in New England where you had um, regulators driven by a concerned Congress demanding more capital at a time when capital wasn't available. Downsizing occurred. Businesses were cut off from credit. But that's history. That's past. What's left is this. Every banker in the world knows there are economic cycles. It's up and then it's down. If they believe that Congress and or regulators driven by Congress will use those downtimes as a time to act repressively, they're not going to want to be holding those cards in their hands. They don't want those banks and their port those businesses in their portfolio. It's a fear factor. Fiducia has built it into the system. The way out is to establish the kind of trust uh, that will allow regulators to behave in a balanced way and, uh, and will allow Congress to step back from this problem. Uh, until that happens, uh, we're going to need Fiducia uh, as a matter of fact and we're going to have uh, a credit crunch as a matter of practical result. So that I think we have to get about the business of reestablishing this trust uh, and I think we've got to get about it soon. And if we could just start with making the message the same. The message from Congress echo the message of the administration, which is only that we want balanced regulation. We're all through with the um, reaction we had to uh, the SNLs, and we're ready to move forward. I think if we can get that much done, uh, we will have done a lot. And I think it's particularly significant and we're very pleased and grateful in New Hampshire that this committee has, has uh, taken on this issue, tried to construct that message, tried to project it, uh, because it's very important if this uh, issue is going to unwind itself. And with that, I'll stop and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Gallagher. We'll go to Mr. Frampton next, and then we'll put questions to the two of you as a panel. Mr. Frampton. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today and hopefully share some of my thoughts on credit availability and the regulation of the banking industry. Uh, you should know that I'm active in the Kentucky Bankers Association, serving as president-elect, and I also serve on the Government Relations Council of the American Bankers Association. But today, I would really like to speak from my perspective as the president and CEO of a small community bank in western Kentucky. And I'm particularly indebted to my congressman, Tom Barlow, and his staff for making it possible for me to be here today and share my views with you. You should also know that only since 1984 have I been a banker. Prior to that time, I worked in two family-owned small businesses. And since that time, while I have been in banking as a profession, I have also invested with other partners in various businesses. And so not only am I on the lender's side of the desk, but I have been and continue to be on the borrower's side of the desk. And I think that gives to me a somewhat different perspective than people who have been professional bankers all their life. If you read my written testimony, uh, where I have excerpted certain experiences from my banking career, you'll see that I have focused on problem areas. And unfortunately, that probably gives you a very negative perspective of my ideas about banking. Uh, my, in my testimony, I attempted to cite problems, and thus uh, I probably am overly negative. I think today I would like to develop uh, some sort of a balanced approach to these ideas and share with you a few positive comments. There's a great deal of satisfaction in my career as a banker. I enjoy working with a broad cross-section of citizens, business people, minorities in my community, helping them resolve problems and using the limited resources that are available to me to assist them. You should also know that Kentucky's banking industry is extremely healthy. Uh, we have over 300 banks in Kentucky ranging in size from 6 billion to less than 1 million. My bank's total assets are about $125 million. That means that 
over 80 percent of the banks in Kentucky are smaller than my bank, so our climate is really made up of many small banks. It would also be helpful for you to know, perhaps, that since 1980, there have been only six bank failures in the state of Kentucky. That is a significant statistic, so I come from a slightly different perspective than bankers in economies in other regions of the country that have had different experiences. There's been much said about regulatory pressure, but I think, again, in view of a balanced approach, I would like you to know that in my short banking career, I've had an excellent relationship with regulators. We have had the opportunity to dialogue about our common problems and common issues. I have not always agreed with them, nor they with me, but we have had the opportunity to discuss our problems. We have had the opportunity to make phone calls one with, to another when they are not on site conducting an exam. And I think that's the way the process should work. And in my experience, it has worked well and has provided the opportunity for us to be a better bank. I also think you should be aware that in Paducah, Kentucky, we have specific regulations. Some bother me individually, but what really troubles me is the cumulative effect of regulation piled upon regulation. In fact, Congress has passed over 44 major pieces of legislation affecting banking in the last five years. The regulatory burden has become the primary focus of how we conduct our business. I think it has been a serious overreaction to the problems of the 80s. And certainly from our perspective in Kentucky, that's doubly true. The problems were in the savings and loan industry. They were not in the banking industry. The pendulum has swung too far. Banking has been and remains an entirely different industry from the savings and loan industry of the 1980s. And as such, it should be differentiated as regulations are passed. Banks continue to handle our own problems through the bank insurance fund. No taxpayer dollars, to my knowledge, have been used to bail out depositors of banks. There is a line of credit that was approved, but it has not been used, and Chairman Hoving, whom I heard speak recently, indicated that there will be no need because the bank insurance fund is healthy and growing as banks improve their balance sheets and reduce their losses. Examples cited in my testimony will emphasize that this regulation of the industry has gone too far. It has restricted the flow of credit to the marketplace. And I'd like to briefly review some of the examples that are set forth in my testimony. I shall not read them because you can uh, enlarge upon any concerns you might have with questions, but I'd like to mention them in summary form. I mentioned bankruptcy and a particular experience our bank has had with a major plant in an adjoining county that went in with a great deal of promise of many new jobs in a county with high unemployment. We funded that and got the, the personal guarantees of the owners, and we had real estate appraisals. It was a brand new facility and a company with an operating track record. But within a year and a half, they ceased operation, took bankruptcy, and we have been nearly three years and multiple thousands of dollars attempting to acquire back that property to which we had a clear and uncontested first mortgage. That property still sits idle while the borrowers have used the court system within bankruptcy to delay and to try to pass blame from themselves to anyone else. That has been extremely frustrating to us as we now have a non-performing loan and a non-earning loan and takes assets out of our balance sheet. I'm happy to say, by the way, although in my testimony, that the plant continues to sit empty, that just today my staff is continuing to negotiate with a group of minority owners who intend to take over that plant. And I truly hope they're successful and help us get by this tremendously burdensome morass and legal entanglement. I mention environmental liability, and I cite two instances. One, where we had a business customer successful and wanted to expand across the street. The normal environmental audit 
determined that there was an unknown and unused kerosene tank under a concrete floor. He spent about $15,000 to determine that. And we chose not to make the loan to him, although he is a good, creditworthy customer, because of the fear of what might happen to our bank if anything ever went wrong under the context of environmental liability. That business transaction did not occur because of the fear of reprisal that might occur under the environmental uh, decisions that we've seen across this country. We are very wary as lenders as to what impact might happen to us as a lender from environmental problems. I also cite an instance where we loaned to a convenience store operator, eight locations in three states. He did pay for an environmental audit to make sure that all locations were clean, and they were clean, but the inordinate cost will be passed on to consumers. And I cite that only as a cost-benefit trade-off, which I think we must always be aware of. In some depth, I approach the concerns of Reg O, and I think it's a sad state of affairs when people such as myself, a director, a stockholder, and an officer, are dramatically limited by the amount of lending that we can do with our own bank. Now, I recognize that there have been abuses and improprieties, but as Mr. Gallagher said, those are a few rotten apples in the basket, not the entire basket. And I do not like to be called accountable for the sins of a few. Nor do my directors, who generally are upstanding, creditworthy citizens and businessmen in our community. And frankly, it's embarrassing for them to have to go to a competitor bank or to an out-of-state bank to borrow funds when they could do so in our own bank. I think that's an example of an overreaction to some few problems lending to insiders. And I might add that examiners have always had a thorough knowledge of loans made to insiders. They see them and look at them first whenever they come into our bank, and this has been true long before Fiducia. But now, I may not borrow more than $100,000 in my own bank, except to finance the purchase of my own home, which I haven't bought since Fiducia, or to finance the education of my children. And I mentioned further that in one of my entrepreneurial ventures with some other partners, I had to go to a competitor bank and borrow funds. I could not do that at my own bank. Now that is perhaps not bad from your perspective, but in a small community, it's not what I nor my directors wish to do. And frankly, what happens here is people who are serving as bank directors choose to retire or get off boards or not accept service because it restricts their ability to borrow in their local community. Furthermore, it's also embarrassing for my directors when they're in the community marketing our bank to say, well, gee, we would like for you to borrow from our bank, but I don't borrow there. It's a double standard, and I think it is dramatic, a dramatic example of regulatory overkill. I also would mention director liability because my directors are frightened in nearly every credit decision they make about the possibility of lender liability. Now, it is not that we've had any problems with it. We have not, except for one small suit I mentioned. We have not had a bad experience, but the fear is always there, and my directors are aware of the potential that their personal assets are at risk because of decisions they make on behalf of our corporation. And that has had a dramatic impact on their approach to lending, and if they even suspect the possibility of some future lender liability problems, I can tell you what happens. The same thing that happens when we suspect an environmental problem or the potential of bankruptcy. The credit is not granted. And it is a fear that is very serious. I mentioned some court cases in Kentucky. The facts do not matter, at least to my directors. What matters is the fact that there were cases brought, there were decisions rendered, and there were awards granted. 
multi-million dollar awards. And for our bank to be found guilty, not of negligence, but just perhaps of bad faith, which has never been clearly defined by the courts, would be a disaster if some plaintiff was successful against our bank in a multi-million dollar lawsuit. I won't delve long into truth and savings. One of my colleagues who knew I was coming here to testify said to me, Joe, send one message, repeal the whole mess. I think that's representative of the sentiments that I hear expressed. Most bankers feel that it will be costly, confusing, and not worth the effort. Now, there are those who take a divergent point of view, and I appreciate that because I want to inform my customers clearly as to what they can expect from their deposit instruments. I do not make a practice of being unethical or misrepresenting what we will pay them, when we will pay it, or how we will pay it. But the thousands and thousands of dollars that our staff is spending in training and becoming educated about truth and savings is an excellent example of regulatory overkill. It is simply not necessary. It will be confusing to our customers who are now beginning to receive newly printed bulletins, brochures, and statements of every product and service that we offer and stating it in terms with which they are totally unfamiliar and do not understand. I think the whole law needs to be rethought. I've cited two examples of bank expansion. If banks are to compete with non-regulated providers of financial services, we must be granted the power to expand. The one example I cite is from a banker friend of mine who runs a very small $25 million bank who wishes to acquire three branches of a savings and loan that has not served its rural communities well. He has spent thousands of dollars, employed professional consultants and attorneys to represent him in the application process and continues today to be extremely frustrated by mixed signals from regulators who first are in favor and then opposed and then say, well, it may be legal, but we don't think it's a good idea. That's extremely frustrating because he wants to expand his product and service offerings into communities that are now underserved, small, rural, agricultural, Kentucky communities. And he is being thwarted by a burdensome regulatory application process that is multi-layered. And finally, I would comment on the Community Reinvestment Act, which has been discussed here today. I have no problem, nor do my directors, with the Community Reinvestment Act. We believe in the intent and the precepts, but we disagree totally with the inordinate amount of paperwork required to document our efforts. We're involved in a number of minority lending projects in our community, three or four at the moment. The last time the regulators were in my bank, they said, Joe, you're doing a great job. The only problem is you've got to spend more time documenting what it is you're doing. And as I cited in my testimony, since 1977, when this law went on the books, not one inquiry have we had from any consumer about what is in our CRA file. Now, that is different than some of the problems in Chicago or other urban problem areas. My point is that community banks, by definition, are serving their communities. I cannot geocode by zip code. I only have one zip code. It makes no sense. So I have a map with multicolored pins that show where we make loans and reject loans. There needs to be a different application of the CRA documentation requirements on smaller community banks. It's not that we don't want to serve our communities or make minority loans or react to small business and consumers. We do. And examiners know that because they come in our bank and are free to look at each and every loan file we have. But the documentation is burdensome, unnecessary, and overwhelming. In summary, it's been very clear that our commercial banks are this country's primary source of credit to small, mid-sized businesses. We need to keep our industry viable so we can continue to provide that credit. 
and keep it flowing. We need to reduce micromanagement of banks by regulation. We need to recognize that no single regulation can be applied uniformly to every bank in this country. Don't make me fill out small business loan applications. Everyone is different. I meet for hours and counsel with each borrower. I cannot relegate that kind of process to a two-page form. You must recognize that the decisions of lending are a complex judgment process. They are not a black and white cookie cutter approach. I also think it's unfair to expect the banking system by regulation to correct our social ills. We have lots of problems. We have discrimination. We have people exempted from the good lifestyles that we would hope everyone strives for. But correcting them through the banking system by inordinate levels of regulation is not appropriate. And I also think serious thought needs to be given to regulating our non-regulated competitors. I'm losing loans to non-regulated competitors. I lost a lease by 200 basis points to a non-bank customer last month. How can that non-bank customer offer funds to my customer at a cheaper rate? I can tell you why. He does not have to document CRA. He does not have to make any loan other than the kind he wishes to make. He does not have a Truth in Savings Act to follow. His directors do not have Reg O and the problems that my directors have. His costs are less. In summary, let me suggest three guiding principles that I hope would help us. You should provide relief as appropriate opportunities arise to an already overregulated and complex industry. House Bill 962 is an example of that. It goes a long way toward correcting some past problems. You should carefully evaluate each new regulatory proposal in the context of a balanced approach. Does the cost of implementing the regulation override the benefit to the taxpayer, the consumer, the depositor, the shareholder, the community? And finally, I think I would like to suggest that perhaps the use of an independent non-political commission. This is not my unique idea. It's been put forth before. Could explore the possibilities of significant legislative changes that would balance public policy and concerns with a regulated financial services industry, which is different today than it has ever been in the past. I think such a study would lead us to a new direction approaching our financial services from a new perspective. Mr. Chairman, I thank you very much for the opportunity to express my thoughts and would welcome any questions you might have. Thank you both for your testimony. Looking at your balance sheet, it wouldn't appear to be a credit crunch at the Paducah Bank and Trust Company. You've got a 78 percent uh, loan to assets lending ratio. That's correct, and all Has the banks... Has the composition of your loan portfolio changed in the last three years? Are you making loans today or forbearing from making loans, avoiding loans that you weren't making? were making a few years ago? The composition of our portfolio has not changed. It has simply grown. It continues to be diverse and reflective of our own local community. We well, have a, That's sort of the anomaly that I'm trying to, to get at. To despite this regulatory burden which you graphically laid out, uh, Paducah keeps lending, 78 percent. And that's probably about as high as you want to go, maybe 80 percent. You don't want to get much beyond that. So you're, you're really about the length you, you, despite the uh, examiners, despite the restrictions, you've been able to continue generating loans and servicing loan demand in your local community. That is correct, but not without cost and a tremendous amount of staff effort. Uh, if you would look at the cost and overhead that our bank has, we're higher than peer group. Uh, we spend a tr tremendous amount of dollars complying with regulations. Uh, that's one of the problems I have to sit here before you today and say we have a credit crunch in Paducah, Kentucky may not be entirely true, but I can tell you that we are certainly concerned about the burdens of regulation that I've talked about today and the way that credit is being funneled away from our market. And I see that as a long-term problem for our industry if you think banks should focus on small to mid-sized companies. I think we will see our deposits flow out of the system, 
There is little growth now in our deposit base. Same is true of my competitors. We will have fewer resources to lend as those flow away from our system. Are you finding, has your uh, return on investment uh, diminished over the last several years due to the regulatory cost? I mean, what are you, what are you making as an annual re rate of return on assets? We're making just below 1% at the moment. It's primarily impacted by a couple of major loan problems we've had. Uh, our overhead costs continue to rise, and I think the way that will be offset is, as you've heard here today, that there will be increased emphasis on fees and other charges to customers that have not been there in the past. This is certainly true of savings instruments uh, under the Truth in Savings. A banker friend of mine just last week said he will probably stop compounding interest for his depositors because of the regulatory uh, burden of explaining how those are calculated. So I think the consumer will suffer with higher costs. So your problem is one of uh, having to spread substantial uh, regulatory cost over a, a fairly or relatively comparatively narrow business base. Totally true and furthermore I'm concerned long term about our industry, our community banks and our ability to continue to provide credit within our communities. As smaller banks are absorbed by larger banks as we compete with non-bank competitors, I think I see the handwriting on the wall. The industry can become troubled as a lender in communities across this country. Now, by your very nature, you're engaged in community reinvestment. You couldn't survive otherwise, and obviously you want to lend money locally because if the local community prospers, you prospered. What sort of extraneous, totally unnecessary documentation requirements to CRA impose upon you that, in your view, simply don't need to be exacted because you're already complying with its intent and purposes. I wish you could see the files that our CA CRA officer accumulates as to the nature of loans that are received in the application stage, how many are turned down, how many are made, where they are located. Uh, we must now document all sorts of information such as that. We also must document all the efforts that our directors, officer, and staff make within the community, be it uh, determining what the needs of our community are by participating in community and civic groups, attending community functions, and sitting on various boards of organizations. All that effort is documented simply to show, and I do not disagree with the purpose, but simply to show that we as a bank are working in some planned fashion to determine the credit needs of our community and hopefully working to meet those needs. Uh, again, the only people who've ever looked at that documentation are bank examiners themselves. And I would submit that when they come in and spend two or three weeks looking at our entire loan portfolio, they will have a very good sense as to the type of loans we're making and whether or not we're serving our community without all the extraneous and specific documentation required under CRA. Thank you very much. Mr. Gallagher, I know Mr. Zellif has some questions for you in particular. Mr. Zellif. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, one big area, Mr. Gallagher, and in the beginning of our problems in New Hampshire, we had, uh, with about two years ago, five out of seven banks went down. Uh, could you maybe just describe what FDIC's role was, um, what we learned from that process in restructuring those banks, and maybe a little bit about where we are today relative to their lending capacity? Surely, um, Congressman Zeloff. Um, on October 10, 1991, uh, five of New Hampshire's seven largest banks holding some 40 percent of New Hampshire's assets, banking assets, uh, were closed simultaneously. Um, I listened to my, uh, my good friend Joe Frampton um, talking about the problems they're having in Paducah. We'd love to have those problems, and I'm sure you'd feel the same way in California and uh, Connecticut. We sound a lot like Paducah in 1985. Sure did. And we got up to $20 billion in banking assets pretty quickly. Uh, by 1991, uh, that had shaved down to about 16, and then we lost 4 to 5 billion in that one closing. And, and all of those were businesses, were loans, were assets, banking assets, and credit relationships that stopped. And they had nowhere else to go. 
and the regulators had arrived and were saying we want more capital, we want more loan loss reserves, uh, we're afraid. So, so that since you couldn't raise more capital outside, we were redlined in effect. Uh, what we did was uh, downsize. Now, a lot of folks in New Hampshire would call that dumb sizing and not downsizing, but that was the only choice we had. And that's still going on. Now, what the FDIC did, and we have to give them a lot of credit as far as it went, uh, they were reacting to a Congress that was reacting to the SNL crisis. And even though banks had a completely different set of problems than the SNLs, the public didn't understand that. It had become a political issue, and action had to be taken. Uh, we just happened to be in the front line. And when you're talking about crowd control, you don't want to be in the front line because it's your bloody shirt that they have to wave to everyone else to control the crowd. And we were it. Uh, they closed the banks all at once. All of the depositors were pay out, uh, paid off. No one lost a nickel. Another 30 banks or so closed with them over that two-year period of time. Uh, what no one seems to have taken into account, nor do they in the construction of Fiducia, is the impact not on banking, but on business, on these credits, these viable living businesses, who, many of whom just happened to be in the wrong bank, who suddenly were in a special asset pool, were the subject of a potential put uh, by the bank that came in and assumed the assets, that if that bank lent them five cents extra for their line of credit, that loan would be then owned by that bank. So they were cut off from credit in most cases. They couldn't get any other credit. Uh, the FDIC did a good job, but it's only since then learned that it's vital to keep these credits when you close a bank to keep these assets connected to a viable banking relationship because business, small business, uh, cannot survive without access to credit, without access to to a seasonal credit, um, uh, buying and selling types of inventory credit, all of that was cut off. When you have a business that has a relationship with a bank, even though it's a rocky relationship, at least it's a lending relationship and it can work. Uh, we were where the FDIC learned that, I think, and we're still working our way through a special asset pool uh, which constitutes almost 10 percent of our banking assets in the state. Uh, that's property owned to be liquidated. That's hanging over our economy. It is difficult for us to come back while that uncertainty is out there. Now, there's a lot of other uncertainty out there. It has to do with things going on here, and you're all well aware of them, and any of you who are in business and have constituents in business know that they're not sure what's going to happen either. But when these uncertainties become resolved, and they will, and demand returns, the question is, will bankers take a chance on having in their portfolio business loans that in a business turndown will be held against them, force them to lower their capital by creating loan loss reserves against those particular loans? Uh, President Siren of the Boston Fed has written a very compelling piece that documents the fact that in banking relationships, of the examiners and banks that were in trouble, in every case, their capital needs were pushed up. Well, you can't raise that ratio without downsizing your assets. And, and that's what makes credit crunch different from regulatory burden and different from tight money. And that, that concern remains until, as I said earlier, we can allow the creditors, like referees, to go back and put on their striped uniforms and their little hats and just regulate, just examine. Don't be responding to uh, political pressure. Um, that's going to take a while to do, but we'd best get started because all of the states that grew quickly in the 80s, all of the areas of the country that grew quickly in the 80s, every single one of them is subject to an economic downturn. And when that happens, the system now says, clamp down hard, demand more capital, create what I call, and what I think is the correct definition of, credit crunch. And it's, in this, it's built into the program now. And that's slowing down lending. And that's why you have bankers buying treasury bills. I have a, as a follow-up question, uh, as you know, we've, we've had uh, several hearings up in New Hampshire on job creation and uh, particularly small business oriented and trying to open up uh, credit lines, uh, SBA 
pilot program and other programs uh, that have been very effective. Um, and we've also dealt with the FDIC in hearings uh, here in Washington where bankers have come down. Uh, Jerry Little and others uh, have made their case. Um, Fidesha, according to your page five of your uh, testimony, gives wide discretion to regulators who in turn appear to be reacting, reacting to congressional uh, pressure. Um, as you know, we have met with the FDIC and we feel that particularly in New Hampshire, uh, we are going beyond the law that Congress was passed and, and regulators uh, in, in, I think, uh, the judgment of many uh, need to step back and take a look at what their role really should be. And we're in the process of having some follow-up meetings. Could you care to comment on the, the, the environment for lending uh, and, and just relative to the, to the regulators uh, at this point and uh, what it's doing to availability of credit, particularly small business. And let me say two things. First of all, uh, largely uh, through um, your efforts um, and the efforts of a Congress that seem to understand, uh, the Small Business As Association came into New Hampshire in force, changed their rules, enhanced credits where banks were afraid to move and really kept us going. We couldn't have made it without that. That was the SBA pilot program? The SBA program. pilot program. Uh, and it, it, it worked wonders and when Credit Crunch comes to the next place, and I hope it isn't Paducah, uh, for your sake, Joe, uh, that's the first thing you're going to need. Uh, beyond that, I think the regulators in our area understand what, what the problem is. If you think of a regulator, you don't have to be a banker to understand this, they're supposed to function like referees. They're supposed to call the game and let the players play. Nobody knows who the head ref is in the NBA, but everybody knows he or she is going to do a good job. And, and that's the way it ought to be. Now, everyone is confessing that our regulators either have been or still are overzealous. What does an overzealous referee do to the game? What does it do to your mind if you think of it? They're supposed to be impartial. They're supposed to be objective. They want to get back to that point. They want to be allowed to get back to that point. Uh, they are beginning to in New Hampshire. They're working hard at it. Not by responding to political pressure, but by being able to be free of it. And I think that's critical uh, throughout the entire system. And it's working in New Hampshire. It, it doesn't seem like we're going to, as a Congress, uh, revisit Fidesia. At least that's, that's the, uh, the opinion that I get. Um, other than uh, H.R. 962, uh, what steps do you feel we need to take? And I guess I'll address this to both of you as my last question. Any, any comments in addition to uh, 962 that we need to take? Well, I think you've, you've taken them here. You're trying to create a record. You're going to review that record. You're giving a basis for um, information and understanding about credit crunch and Fidisha to go back into uh, Illinois, back, back into the Carolinas, back into California, uh, back into Connecticut. Uh, that's a very important step. As I said in my earlier comments, if we could just get the message the same, just the message, uh, instead of having regulators here conflicting messages, they are ready and willing and I believe able to do their job. Uh, We've got to get it off the political um, front, front burner, in short. And that isn't an easy thing to do. Uh, but it's got to happen, and Congress is going to have to work at it. There are some areas where combining policy and politics is, is real hard. It's real difficult. Um, I'm, I think at times of um, whether you could pass a law that would and codify military triage where the purpose of which, as you know, is to take the healthiest of the wounded and get them back on the battlefield and treat the ones that are hurt the most last. Um, that's unfair. Um, that's terrible. You can't mean that. Well, that's the way it is uh, because we're trying to win that war. Now, I'm, well, what I'm saying is, is that when you're away from, from the political front burners, you can make those kinds of decisions. There are, 10,000 others that you all know of better than I that you can. But when they get out front and it becomes a political issue, when someone needs to be blamed and someone's screaming for someone's scalp, then the paralysis sets in. So I think to the extent that you're giving voice to these um, concerns, allowing us to come in and, and tell you this, 
um, that you're doing a great deal now. And, and if you can get that message working, I think the rest of the onion will peel off over time. Mr. Frampton, I, I uh, admire uh, certainly the, the, your situation relative to banking out in Kentucky. And uh, uh, do you have any of the same kind of problems we have with small business, the cost of regulation, the cost of the process of the paperwork of getting small business loans? Is small business becoming an extinct uh, variety of business, or, or do we have a chance to survive? And do you look at, uh, from your point of view, do you look at how much work and effort that you have to put forth in the bank's resources to approve a small loan of, let's say, ten or fifteen thousand dollars versus a two hundred thousand or three hundred or five hundred thousand dollar loan? I think you make a very important point, and I would not go so far as to say small business has or will become extinct, but the Regulations that we must work toward as we consider and approve small business loans create an inordinate burden on the small businessman. Not just the cost of appraisals, not just the time he spends generating the data that the bank needs to make a decision, but more and more we're finding that in order to substantiate the decision from a regulatory point of view, we must ask small business owners to hire professionals to develop, for example, business plans for them, which indicate future cash flows, projections, uh, historical data that perhaps will give us comfort that the loan will be a good one. Unfortunately, many of our small business owners do not have the expertise to generate that kind of data that banks are required now to analyze when making a credit decision, and that drives up costs, and I hear increasing frustration from small business owners. Why must I do this? Why must we spend all these dollars on professional fees, appraisals, environmental audits? When really small business lending is a character decision, bottom line, every time. I do not care how good the appraisal is nor how thorough the environmental audit is. If I have a borrower of substantial character, the prospects of that loan working out are excellent. If that character is not in place, regardless of the projections and the other things available to us, the loan can become quickly troubled. I think we're jeopardizing small business ownership and future growth by the layer upon layer of regulatory burdens we're forcing banks to go through in order to grant credit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Cox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, uh, ask you, Mr. Frampton, about the uh, future of the CRA. It has been suggested by some of the members of the House Banking Committee that, in fact, uh, uh, new requirements be imposed that would uh, uh, permit uh, neighborhood organizations to have uh, veto power over the closure of uh, a bank uh, uh, office in a particular neighborhood. Uh, what effect would that have uh, on uh, your business, on the extension of credit into neighborhoods where we're trying to expand credit? Mr. Cox, I'm hired by my board of directors to run a profitable company. It must make a profit to survive. If management prerogatives that affect the survivability of my company are made by people outside the company, within the community at large, I think we put in jeopardy the ability of banks to serve their community. That does not mean that we should not that we should make decisions in isolation from public opinion or public need. But frankly, if we closed our business, including all of our branches, and ceased to exist, there are today in the marketplace innumerable alternatives for customers. And there may be a vacuum short term, but long term it will be filled. We've seen that as banks have expanded across state lines. Uh, I think it's inappropriate to have decisions that affect the future of my business made by special interest groups or groups who may represent a special interest within our community. I'll tell you what uh, I thought of when I heard of this proposal. 
Uh, I thought of Santa Monica, California, uh, where we have had uh, such a sour experience with rent control. It was uh, 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 proposed effectively at one point that uh, the owner of real estate couldn't take a building out of service as a rental property without going and getting approval once he put it in service uh, as a rental. Well, of course, uh, if you haven't yet made the decision to invest in Santa Monica and get into the rental real estate business, uh, mm -hmm. how likely are you to go in there uh, given that uh, you may lose control over the direction of your business? If you haven't yet gone into a neighborhood with a bank branch, how likely are you to go in there if somebody may say, we don't care how much trouble you have running this place or how much money you might be losing, you have to stay, you can't close. Uh, isn't it likely that we're going to deter people from going into the very areas that are toughest to lend to uh, with this kind of regulation, well intended as it might be? Let me give you a specific example that relates directly to our bank. We have a main office and four branches and we're considering opening another branch in our county to serve a growing area of that county. Opening that branch may be predicated due to cost factors on closing and moving an existing branch. I don't know that. We're currently studying that. But one alternative, instead of an investment in a totally new branch, is to move one where we deem that community already served by us. To have that decision made by people outside our company, I do not think is good long-term economics. Mr. Gallagher, your testimony uh, in particular concerning Fiducia was very persuasive. Uh, I will share with you a little bit of history about how this became law. Uh, as you know, uh, a banking bill was uh, uh, being buffeted about from uh, place to place, uh, uh, hearing to hearing, uh, markup to markup, and uh, it came to the floor more than once. Uh, there was difficulty getting the votes for a banking bill that dealt with some of the bigger issues like interstate branching. Uh, and ultimately what came to the floor at the very end of session was a bill that was described to members who voted on it uh, as stripped down entirely, uh, containing nothing more than a recapitalization of the BIF. Many members, and I've investigated this since we had testimony about Fedish in an earlier hearing, uh, voted in favor of that legislation because they believed all that it did uh, was recapitalize the BIF. This, of course, uh, uh, was members who do not serve on the Banking Committee and weren't privy to the details. Uh, as a consequence, I'm not at, uh, at all sure that we mightn't be able to put together the votes to repeal uh, a bill which is as onerous uh, as you describe. Uh, in fact, it has been described by others in precisely the same way. And I think many of us are well aware of just how bad Fiducia is and what a bad message that it sends. So uh, I wonder if, uh, uh, given that it's a real prospect uh, to repeal it, whether you'd recommend that. Well, what happened to us in New England was, was pretty drastic, and Fiducia wasn't law when that happened. So that we know that the enforcement power was was there. It simply wasn't used. But I'm more concerned about, I guess, at the moment, although I, I don't disagree with, with your perceptions, uh, is that uh, we, we try to do what we can to solve what we have. Uh, Fiducia was the logical extension of a thought process that sort of went like, like this. Um, we've raised the deposit insurance to $100,000. We've taken away, quote, market discipline from selection of where you put your deposits. We've deregulated the SNLs. Uh, what we should have done, uh, so the saying and thinking goes, is increased our regulation to match. We had the legislation on the books. The supervisors of, of that process, of the examining process, either didn't know they had the power didn't understand it, didn't have the will to use it, were captured in some way by the banks, uh, or didn't know the bad news in time. And so Fiducia, which was really in the overall bill, just no one paid any attention to it, Fiducia wound up uh, being all that was left when they took out all of the benefits that, in fact, had originally passed the House Committee, or at least many of them had, that the House Committee did all right its first time through. Uh, I think we've got to get away from the fight and I think the bankers who were pushing into state banking and powers at that time were, were giving the wrong signal themselves. That, that wasn't a thing to be asking for at the end of the 80s. 
Uh, what, what we have to do now, it seems to me, is, is to uh, stop fighting uh, and start, uh, start building a system where the Congress really does rely and trust its, its uh, regulators, really can rely on them, where the bankers believe that they too can rely on them to call the shots evenly and call them in a balanced way. Uh, when that, as I said earlier, when that trust is restored, I think Fiducia will simply fall away because, in fact, it limits the examiner's response. It takes away flexibility. Uh, but, you, but until that trust goes, I think you could get a lot of people to sign it, and obviously the uh, B writer bill has, has a lot of support. Uh, but I don't think it's going to pass, and I think a lot of energy is going to be consumed uh, pointing out the bad things that are going on, and we'll hear more reports from the GAO and, and, and all of the things that are going on, more the sky is falling talk. Um, I, what I think we've got to do is get away from that. Um, if I thought you could do it, I'd, I'd say go to it, but there's enough suspicion, there's enough concern so that I think we've just got to do the best we can with what we have and at least have Congress echo the administration's message, which is that we need more balance, we need uh, uh, more character lending, uh, and so on and so forth. We're, we're going to have to work at this slowly. Uh, I'd like to ask you about uh, the GAO since you brought it up, but I'd, I'm just uh, curious as a matter of, of uh, your perception, since you are certainly uh, expert in this area. Uh, given that your testimony was so strong uh, concerning Fiducia, uh, and given your own sensibilities uh, about this subject, uh, do you really believe that it's so hopeless in Congress that we shouldn't bother to try and fix it? Well, I've been giving that testimony for the last two and a half years, and um, um, maybe it's time, but uh, they say things take time around here. Um, you can hold your breath. I just think it's, I, I hear what you say, and I, I wish that were so, um, but I really think that it's more important um, that we get down, get banking out of the political area and, 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 and bank examination back to where it ought to be. And uh, I don't think that fight is likely to lead to that end, but um, I'll be certainly happy to weigh in when it happens. Uh, the GAO uh, question that your earlier response raised uh, is this. Uh, the General Accounting Office uh, was warning us last fall about uh, a December surprise of presumed catastrophic proportions. Uh, whatever happened to that prediction by GAO? Well, fortunately, it's, it's still on the record, as were a number of other predictions made at hearings held by the Senate Banking Committee in late October. Um, there was never going to be a December surprise. Um, this was just another extension of what I think was a kind of a political hysteria. There are a lot of people who got a lot of attention, perhaps even made a lot of money, talking about the SNL debacle. And I, I'm not sure that they ever wanted it to end. You know, they could get one more whack at this. Um, and uh, there were a lot of people who were simply intimidated or terrified that it might be going to happen again. Um, I'm frankly glad those people pointed at, at the fence, and I'm happy they, they uh, struck out. Mr. Frampton, uh, you wanted to respond to that? As I recall, December 19, 1992 was a reporting date mandated by Fiducia, and months before, in committees and forums where I participated, the information was quite clear that there would not be a December surprise. In fact, I remember that issue being discussed and made of record at the American Bankers Association meeting earlier that fall in Boston. Um, most of us in the industry did not believe that there would be a December surprise, and I think the facts have borne out that reality. If I, if the gentleman would yield, I'd one person yield. who kept alive the suspicion and the fear was, and is no longer with us, a very able government uh, servant, uh, Bill Taylor, FDIC, who made a number of speeches, or several influential speeches, where he predicted some sort of apocalyptic uh, events on the horizon. So, I mean, it wasn't just uh, political fear-mongering going on. It was the regulators themselves, and in that case, a very able one, I think. Well, no one wanted to come in. He was a very able regulator, and he is sorely missed. Um, I think he, he might have had the capacity to convince Congress, in fact, to, to back away. He was 
trying to ensure, I believe, his absolute credibility so that there was no surprise. Yeah. And, and uh, in that sense, he was probably overestimating just, just a little, but it might have done good in the long run. Uh, I have no further question. Mr. Frampton, if you would care to comment uh, on Fiducia, uh, I'd be interested to hear. That, that is well, the specific I, topic that Mr. Gallagher and I, I were I talking about, the, the prospect in Congress thing, for changing the law. I guess the optimum thing would be to see the entire piece of legislation withdrawn, because I think much of it was unnecessary and perhaps was done uh, under the belief that you described. Uh, probably that's not a reality now, and I would hope that as you have the opportunity, certain provisions of that which are clearly overkill and clearly not directly uh, designed to impact safety and soundness could be repealed, or perhaps, as has been said here, an attitude from Congress that would be reflected by regulators uh, that would permit them some latitude in enforcing the provisions of FIDUCIA would be most helpful. I think uh, much of the regulatory environment is driven by the events of the 80s and early 90s and uh, the experience that the regulators have, ha have had with the Congress. And I would like to see that pendulum swing back somewhat to an area of reason and an area of trust, as Mr. Gallagher has said, we all must work to revisit and reestablish. Well, I would just encourage both of you to uh, uh, take more heart in the prospect that we might do some good in Congress every now and then. Uh, I don't believe that the entire system is a one-way ratchet in the wrong direction toward ever-increasing regulation and less and less uh, uh, growth and economic opportunity and, and bank earnings and so on. I do think we can fix some of this. Uh, the problems are becoming uh, ever better understood, uh, and I'm certainly uh, going to keep up the pressure, uh, both on the regulators, uh, on the administration, uh, and within the Congress to get rid of this credit crunch. It means uh, jobs. It means uh, the livelihood of so many Americans. We've got to fix the problem. And uh, so if you raise your expectations a little bit about what Congress might do, uh, uh, perhaps some of us will feel a little of that pressure and respond. If you recall, one of my opening comments was one of optimism, and I, I share that. I thank you very much. Your testimony was, uh, I believe, just excellent. Mr. Rush. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Frampton, uh, <clears throat> you, uh, in your testimony a little earlier, you indicated a uh, uh, concern about non-bank competitors, uh, that they were involved uh, in competing with with, with, with regulated, with banks who are regulated, and that they have a, a basically a, a easier time at it. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Can you give us some examples of uh, uh, how they are able to provide credit services or banking services or financial services uh, in ways that you're not able to what I speak about are entities such as insurance companies, uh, stock brokerage firms, uh, other corporate conglomerates who choose to provide certain selected financial services within the marketplace, which I assume they choose because they see a profit to be made. And I would, uh, for example, point out uh, many of the automobile manufacturers have captive finance companies. Uh, interestingly, the uh, specific lease that I mentioned, and we do fund leases, was to uh, a company known as Textron, and I really don't know about their financial services, but as a commercial banker, it hurts me to lose a financial deal to what I perceive to be a non-financial company. And I think the point I attempt to make is those companies are not driven by this burden of regulation that creates levels of regulatory examination and cost that I must undergo. Uh, I think I have many costs involved, and we've heard percentages here of overhead dedicated directly to uh, complying with regulations. My sense is many of these non-bank competitors do not have those costs and thus can offer many, not all, but many of the same services to my customers that I can at a lesser cost. Some, for example, 
I would cite credit unions. I don't have a particular problem with them. They serve a consumer need and probably don't do much small commercial business lending, but do not, for example, I think, pay federal tax. I do have to pay federal tax, and that precludes me from accumulating capital, which lets me grow more to provide more credit. So we're simply not at a level playing field with all entities across our economy who provide financial services. Thank you. Uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Mr. Cox, uh, asked you a question about uh, <coughs> CRA, some of the proposed CRA uh, uh, requirements or extending the requirements uh, specifically to address the issue of veto power by neighborhood organizations uh, over banks moving from one location to another location. Without addressing uh, the um, uh, this proposal in a literal sense, there's the spirit behind the proposal addresses a concern, uh, particularly in large urban uh, areas and minority communities, where uh, for arbitrary in some instances, arbitrary uh, reasons. Uh, in some instances, purely business reasons that don't reflect upon a survival of neighborhoods, particular neighborhoods, uh, or providing access to to banking services in particular neighborhoods. Uh, in my district, I would say that over the last. 20, 25 years, we've had probably a 80 percent reduction in the uh, availability of, of, uh, of banking services, uh, financial services, simply because uh, banks, which once served that neighborhood, are now uh, nowhere to be found, just arbitrarily moved. And I think that the spirit of that. Uh, of, of that of these proposals uh, is to try to ensure that there that a total uh, comprehensive approach or comprehensive evaluation of the impact neighborhood impact uh, uh, is considered if a bank is to remove is is to move out of particular neighborhoods. Could you address not necessarily the, again the uh, literal uh, proposal, but how do you think that we could uh, address the spirit of what uh, legislation like this would attempt to uh, to uh, uh, speak to? I do not disagree with the spirit of the proposed mm -hmm. legislation. Um, what I disagree with is the absolute veto power of any group over a bank's decision to stay or not to stay. Mm -hmm. We already have specific branch closure or moving notification requirements that we must file with our regulatory bodies. Uh, my thought is that some process of dialogue that would invite public comment and discussion with financial institutions as to how they may join in partnership with the community to better serve them and thus stay as a player in that neighborhood or community would be helpful, or some discussion as to the specific needs of the neighborhood that the bank may not be aware of. So I, I would envision a process, and I, I'm not certain that it may not already exist with the notification procedures. I have not participated in that process because I haven't closed the facility, so I really don't know what's involved. But I would think a process like that to encourage dialogue and discussion prior to a decision being made would let all interested parties have the opportunity to voice their opinions. I do disagree with an absolute veto right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Rush. Mr. Shays. Thank you. The time is late, and you gentlemen have been waiting a long time. We have two others behind us, behind you. But I just want to say that um, I've attended a number of credit hearings 
uh, crunch hearings, and, and I have found uh, this hearing to be really the most interesting. All those who have testified have really been outstanding, and I just would, would add uh, two observations. One is that uh, I, I try not to make this comment often, but you know, you meet the enemy, and the enemy is us. I, I, um, it was very discouraging for me to, to, to have put so much um, pressure on the administration to try to deal with it from an, uh, from an administrative standpoint and, and not have the regulators overregulate since they underregulate in one area to compensate and overregulate. And, um, and then to find out that laws that I voted for uh, helped make the problem even worse. And I, I just say this as an observation that uh, uh, we, we on, uh, legislators who don't serve on the banking committee and try to develop an expertise but don't have it, uh, uh, and this is one reason, frankly, why I got on this committee this time, was to develop a better expertise. Um, uh, the bottom line is that uh, we really felt we were simplifying the process and we, uh, and we made it far worse. I mean, to think that I might be telling a bank president what they can make, you know, is just, it blows my mind. The challenge, though, is that I think a lot of legislators now are of a mind to vote against any banking bill, you know, because the, the, we, whatever we've done, we've made it worse. I mean, going back to even, I think, expanding the... Uh, the uh, deposit insurance uh, to a hundred thousand dollars. I mean, we, so the other observation I'd make is that it just. Um, I, I guess I guess what I'm saying to you is I think that a number of legislators are simply going to uh, just not be connected to any banking bill because every banking bill we've seen over the last few years has caused more harm than good. And and uh, uh, but I also take the view of my colleague that we want to do the right thing and I think the process of forcing us to deal with this issue and, and making sure that every legislator is aware of what we have right now and what we need to do is absolutely essential. One last observation, uh, just as President Nixon was the one who was able to, you know, to recognize China, I really think that we have a better possibility here of, um, of having uh, the Clinton administration uh, have more impact in educating Congress and the American people to the need to, to, uh, to have more flexibility. So, on that side, I, I'm hopeful. It'll be interesting to see how it turns out. Bottom line is, I didn't ask you a question, but I, I want you to know I'm very impressed with the comments that both of you have made and found it very helpful. I'm sorry, I think of other things you said, but it is an, an incredible analogy to think that, in a sense, all of New Hampshire was redlined. Um, and parts of all, in, in, in Connecticut as well, we had people who had relations with banks and had, had them for years and then those banks went under. And it's amazing to me, the American people uh, in, in, in so many areas, in, including my district, a well-educated district, they kept referring to bailing out banks. And, and I, I had one, we had a major uh, CBT, as you know, when, when, went under. And I had people in my community man meeting angry that we were bailing out banks. And I had, I said, raise your hand. How many of you had, uh, you know, had uh, used Connecticut Bank and Trust and the Bank of New England? And they said, and I'd say about a third of the hands went up or a fourth. I probably had about 20 people raise their hand. I said, we bailed you out. And they didn't know that. Yeah. It, it's interesting. Um, th that's what happens when it gets political. You get yeah. these slogans. It's a bank bailout bill. And then everyone said, well, if they were really sophisticated, then they would call it a deposit of bailout yeah, exactly. bill. But, but, but who didn't get bailed out or who got thrown out was the other side of that balance sheet, the asset side of that yeah. balance sheet. And that's what the credit crunch is all about. And I, I know you didn't ask for a comment, but um, it takes a lot of courage to be willing to address the banking issue. It's, it's the sort of thing that only experts know about and that sort of thing. But these are not these are not issues that are terribly convoluted and complex. You're in politics. You understand what's going on. This is behavior we're talking about. When, when <coughs> Congressman Cox talks about what kind of behavior will you get with a certain law on the book, you don't have to be a banker to understand that. It's, you're going to get a certain kind of behavior. Um, what I think we need now is to just quiet things down for the, all the reasons you stated and then move slowly towards, towards resolving it when it's not such a political issue. If we could do that, we'd do a lot. Thank you very much, both of you, for coming and Thank testifying. You, You've been extremely helpful and forthcoming, and we will benefit from your comments. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our final two witnesses in our last panel is composed of uh, two attorneys from Millbank Tweed, Tom Harnsberger, who is a senior real estate partner, and Frank Pulio, who is a 
partner in the corporate banking department at uh, Millbank Tweed. Is it Puleo or Puleo? Puleo. Puleo. Right. Well, you both come from the first firm. You can, the same firm, you can take your choice as to which goes first, but you uh, have, I believe, submitted uh, testimony. I have yours, Mr. Puleo. I haven't seen Mr. Harnsberger's, but uh, assuming you have prepared testimony, we'll make it part of the record. I do not, sir. Okay, we'll make your comments part of the record. Mr. Harnsberger, your testimony as submitted to us will be made part of the record so that you can uh, summarize it and uh, we'll turn to you first for for your testimony. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the subcommittee. Uh, uh, I'm honored to have this opportunity uh, to discuss with you the subject of the uh, credit crunch. I'd particularly like to thank Congressman Cox for inviting us to uh, discuss this with you. Uh, it's no surprise to you, based on all of the expert testimony you've heard so far, that uh, uh, I'm unable to identify uh, for you any single uh, legal provision or even uh, uh, a group of legal provisions or regulations uh, which uh, can be uh, uh, identified as the source of the credit slowdown or the credit crunch. Uh, you've heard from uh, bankers and regulators uh, and others who have more first-hand knowledge of this situation that, uh, than uh, outside legal counsel. Uh, nevertheless, as an advisor to a number of financial institutions who are financial services providers, uh, I think it's my perception that the credit crunch is caused by a multitude of factors uh, in combination, uh, which range from slack demand in certain sectors uh, to a multitude of legal pr provisions which individually are well-intentioned, uh, but which in the aggregate uh, constitute an increasingly heavy regulatory burden, uh, which has an adverse effect on the ability and the willingness of financial institutions in the United States to increase the availability of credit. Um, while the benefits of such regulations uh, often appear clear, uh, I think the costs are frequently difficult to predict in advance. Uh, difficult to quantify even after the fact uh, and all too easy to uh, underestimate. Um, a recurring theme of uh, my remarks will be the necessity of striking the proper balance between the benefits of regulation and the benefits of having bankers in a position to exercise sound business judgment, uh, to take appropriate risks in pursuit of rewards for shareholders, and as a result, to make credit available, which will stimulate growth in jobs and in the economy as a whole. Um, and I think that the uh, testimony of the prior two panelists, uh, in fact, uh, also had that same recurring theme, uh, the question of, of balance in the regulatory process. Um, I'll try to focus on uh, two facets of uh, the situation, which are aspects that may not have been identified in prior discussions. The first relates to capital requirements and the second involves recent legislative and regulatory efforts which I believe may have had the effect of discouraging bankers from exercising their business judgment and encouraging them to substitute the judgment uh, of outside advisors. Um, <clears throat> first, uh, the, the question of capital requirements. Certainly no one quarrels with the necessity for adequate bank capital. Care must be taken to assure uh, balance in the requirements. Excessive capital requirements can be counterproductive uh, by effectively reducing the return on investment in bank stocks to the point where banks cannot compete for additional capital. I do not suggest that the Basel requirements as implemented by the U.S. regulators uh, or the current leverage ratios uh, implemented by the U.S. regulators are excessive. The problem is that there are more indirect ways in which capital requirements have been elevated, and these can have significant effects. The enactment of fiducia, which has been discussed here uh, uh, quite frequently, uh, and the promulgation of the prompt corrective action regulations under fiducia formalized the notion that a well-capitalized financial institution has a 10% risk-based capital ratio. 
This effectively raised the capital hurdle from the 6% leverage ratio and 8% Basel requirements to a 10% uh, ratio. While I recognize that financial institutions are not required to be well capitalized, I'm confident that it's every banker's objective to achieve and maintain a 10% risk-based capital ratio in light of the prompt corrective action standards. Uh, moreover, maintaining the 10% capital ratio provides greater flexibility under regulations in terms of the acceptance of brokered deposits, and it lowers the deposit insurance assessments under the FDIC's recently adopted transitional risk-based deposit insurance premiums. Uh, a further example of sort of creeping elevation of capital requirements, the FDIC has now submitted comments on whether its final risk-based insurance assessments should include a so-called minimal risk category. Uh, that is one with a capital level which is above the 10 percent capital level. Uh, the obvious risk here is that this inadvertently further elevates the hurdle for a top-tier bank, perhaps without intending to do so. Banks are concerned not only with the, regu with the regulatory consequences of these escalating hurdles, but also with the effects uh, that this will have on the confidence of its customers and shareholders. Um, it is to be expected that customers and shareholders will be uh, sensitive to the uh, regulatory benchmarks that are set. Uh, and uh, bankers tell me that uh, this is already evident in trading and dealing arrangements and the cost of funds uh, in their credit relationships with customers. Uh, and also in the earnings multiples according, accorded to uh, bank stocks in the market. Increased capital costs have, along with other changes in the market, uh, also uh, fundamentally altered the banking business in the United States in other ways. In this new environment, it's difficult for banks to earn a competitive return merely by uh, collecting deposits and lending money. And as they look for other routes, including uh, the ability to downsize their balance sheet and increase their uh, fee returns, uh, they've turned to the securitization of assets. This has become a major element of the intermediation process by banks. As you undoubtedly know, this is a process whereby banks sell assets to the marketplace through financial vehicles which issue a variety of securities. Often the selling bank can retain a portion of the income from these assets, such as servicing fees, while, while transferring many of the risks of ownership and eliminating the need of borrowing funds to carry the asset. Securitization frees balance sheet capacity for additional extensions of credit, and as such, it can be a major contributor to alleviating the credit crunch. That fact suggests to me that uh, uh, the legislative proposals to facilitate securitization of commercial loans, for example, through authorization of entities analogous to the federal mortgage agencies, would further considerably your efforts to alleviate the credit crunch. Um, at the same time, I urge you not to overlook potential adverse impact from seemingly esoteric or minor changes in the capital rules, which I believe will have a potentially significant adverse impact on the ability of banks to securitize assets. In particular, I'm concerned about the so-called recourse proposals, which are currently being considered by regulatory agencies under the aegis of the Federal Financial Institutions Examination Council. <clears throat> As you may know, to make asset securitization efficient, various techniques are used to increase the credit quality of the assets for the buyer and this can result in the retention by the selling banks of a portion of the normal risks of ownership. This retention of risk is referred to by the bank regulators as recourse. Bank regulators already require that for the purposes of computing capital requirements, the retention of risk or recourse is treated as the retention of the entire asset pool that otherwise would be shown as sold. This goes well beyond the normal uh, requirements of generally accepted accounting principles in terms of the way in which asset sales are reflected. Some would argue that the existing rules already result in a disproportionate capital burden 
at the same time, there are new proposals being considered uh, which are still in the formative stages, but as I understand the proposals, they would further broaden the concept of what constitutes recourse. The industry has expressed concern that the new broader recourse proposals would substantially increase the costs associated with securitization and would potentially uh, cause securitization programs to be terminated. Um, I'm concerned that this is inconsistent with efforts to facilitate the securitization of bank assets, including in particular commercial loans, and would further prolong the, the credit crunch. Let me turn to a second uh, area, uh, which I think has perhaps contributed to the credit slowdown, and that is a trend evident in recent initiatives by both Congress and regulatory agencies, the consequence of which I believe is to discourage bank officers and directors from exercising their independent business judgment and to encourage, or in some cases even require, over-reliance on independent advisors. <clears throat> Again, no particular statutory section or regulatory pronouncement is at fault, but this unhealthy result flows from a combination uh, of regulatory actions and statutory provisions. Perhaps the most important is the director and officer liability cases which are often brought against the officials of failed institutions on the basis of simple negligence. Uh, as a consequence of bringing these cases on the basis of simple negligence, bank officers and directors have, to a large extent, lost the benefits of the traditional business judgment rule. Under the traditional business judgment rule, courts will not second-guess officers and directors in the absence of fraud, self-dealing, violation of laws, or at least gross negligence. None of the cases I'm talking about involved those elements, and yet bank officers are being subjected to 2020 hindsight by bank regulators. This is not an enviable position in light of oil shocks, dramatic changes in the tax laws affecting real estate, and significant regional economic slowdowns. Um, putting aside the effect on individuals and <clears throat> granting that there have been abuses which more than justified action against some bank officials, trying to focus on the effect of this behavior by the regulators on the industry as a whole, uh, and I think you see that a very strong signal is sent to uh, directors and officers of banks, which is causing them to behave in an extremely conservative fashion. While the FDIC and the RTC pay lip service to the notion that directors and officers of failed institutions are not presumed to violate law and are not guarantors of the health of their institutions, their actions in many cases appear to contradict their words. Against this background, <clears throat> today's bankers uh, naturally take a cautious attitude. Uh, when considering a given request for credit or considering a new product initiative, which would be a new source of revenue to the banking institution, management is more likely than before to make judgments which reflect disproportionately the risks as compared to the rewards. A banker may simply forego the development of a new product or a new activity because of regulatory uncertainties which his advisors cannot cure. Uh, in this respect, the consequence of this overly cautious attitude uh, extends beyond the uh, credit crunch and inhibits uh, banks from developing needed new sources of revenue. I think that the uh, uh, problem in this arena is again coming back to the concept of balance, uh, that there needs to be a restoration of balance in the regulatory process. There are other illustrations which I think have been discussed uh, by other panelists and uh, uh, my colleague, Mr. Harnsberger, I think will probably give some examples of uh, situations in which there are uh, either re legislative requirements uh, or legislative pronouncements which send a strong signal to bankers that they should be <coughs> backed up by uh, independent appraisers, uh, independent accountants' opinions, independent legal opinions, where the tendency is to uh, cause bankers to be overly reliant on their advisors rather than uh, uh, making the business judgments uh, which they ought to be making and which would produce a more healthy uh, growth environment, both in terms of credit 
and in terms of new products. Uh, let me. Uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Harnsberger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, special thanks to Mr. Cox for inviting us to come here today. Uh, we appreciate the chance to speak to the subcommittee. We appreciate your forbearance as well as your willingness to come. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I will be brief in uh, citing several examples of how the credit crunch affects real estate, in particular in California. Um, I'm here to cite in general the uh, use of FIREA and its appraisal requirement as an example of regulatory overkill per se. Uh, I'm sorry Mr. Shays has left the room right now, but I uh, listened with interest to his example of the five hotels built in one city at one time. Uh, as an example, he utilized of bad judgment, obviously, of some lenders to provide the funds. Uh, I can think also of numerous instances, and I'm sure we all can, of uh, high-rise buildings being built in West Los Angeles where one good 20-story apartment would work and 11 went up in a three-year period, and the last 10 were taken back by their lenders. Um, but the appraisal requirement of FIREA would not have stopped that, nor would the suggestion earlier today of requiring a study of what else in the marketplace is likely to happen because real estate lending takes time and real estate projects take time, two, three, five years to come to fruition. And by the time anyone forecasts the market with accuracy, uh, the subject project is well under construction and once half built, it needs to be finished. Uh, and requiring an outside appraiser to spend additional money to study even doubly carefully what the marketplace is likely to hold and then punishing a banker if he might be wrong with a bad business decision by simple negligence still will not stop a lending practice where a number of people perceive the future different than it is and by the time they're aware of the problem they're too late to stop it. Uh, but let's take a brief historical perspective on the timing of FIREA. In 1981 the Congress passed some legislation signed by the President creating real estate as the only remaining tax deduction of any great value. 1986, after five years of a superheated economy building new real estate, that benefit was taken away. There, at that point in time, there were numerous projects, two or three years worth, still in the pipeline. So by 1989, the new ones stopped, and lenders and the rest of us perceived there was a real estate recession coming, whether there was a non-real estate recession to join it. Uh, bankers stopped making new real estate loans. Appraisers became very concerned about values. Lawyers finished closing deals and started doing workouts. Uh, banks, particularly in New England, suffered the experience of banks in Texas. Um, California hadn't yet. And FIREA was enacted far after it was needed, if it was ever needed, to do something which was no longer going to happen, i.e., no new real estate lending excesses. Uh, because the bankers and Wall Street their shareholders, their directors, their customers were not going to see a repeat of an episode of the prior decade and had already ceased the kinds of behavior that we are most concerned about. Nonetheless, FIREA enacted a series of requirements, most of which are mandatory, uh, requiring a huge increase in the number of appraisers at a time when there wasn't a huge increase in the number of appraisers available. Hence, an enormous difficulty in getting an appraisal on a timely basis. Uh, six weeks would be flabbergastingly quick, 12 weeks being fairly typical, and if you do something uh, that's important and necessary to do a transaction uh, under time pressure, you might even make errors. So we then launched into a couple year period where appraisers scurried to try to make deals work if they could. People evaluated very, with great deliberation whether values would hold in an uncertain marketplace. People incurred costs and nonetheless additional bad transactions went forward because no one foresaw how bad the market would be, particularly in California. Uh, but FIREA didn't stop that. Now we're in a position where, through a series of legal mandates in FIREA, we must do appraisals on practically every real estate related loan, even where it's not the real estate value that will pay back the loan, but rather the credit of a single occupant, the credit of a business, the credit of a tenant such as the government. Um, or a variety of other features other than the value of the real estate asset being produced. So we now have a, a regulatory requirement which was not necessary to stop an abuse, which requires a known and certain cost in every transaction practically, regardless of whether the real estate value is material to the credit being repaid. 
so as lawyers, we are called upon to structure transactions as best we can to, for example, avoid taking real estate as collateral in a transaction where it would be additional useful collateral to have. We avoid taking it to rely entirely on the credit of the borrower, thus avoiding the requirement. Uh, we save time. Three or four months to get an appraisal in a complex corporate transaction is inefficient, ineffective, time-consuming, and when people work in the private world rapidly, time is money. And you cannot afford to take the time to do it right. Uh, you can't get that much value from the report anyway. Uh, and in a lot of cases, it's simply better to do without in order to make the credit the transaction work. Fire rate does not accomplish its intended purpose in that case, obviously. But nonetheless, the letter of the law is followed. In addition, there are plenty of cases where the real estate appraiser is called upon to do an utterly impossible job. Uh, likewise, the President of Congress are often called upon to do some of the same impossible tasks, solve problems which are not always soluble. But the appraiser is called upon to pick a scientific finite value of a piece of real estate several years in the future, which is a simply impossible task. And appraisers follow a not too well defined science or art of describing what's gone on in the past and projecting it out to the future. Uh, at best, a very uncertain process. And yet, their final answer comes out as a certain number. Well, given the liability of individuals who misperform with banks and other institutions, appraisers have become just as conservative as bankers. So when faced with a range of choices or range of values and uncertainty in the appraisal process, the appraisers choose the most conservative answer, one that could never be too high. So if you take a difficult and time-consuming process and impose it on transactions and then come out with the lowest possible answer, an awful lot of things don't work anymore. And so some legitimate real estate transactions do not work in a context where they otherwise might have worked had FIREE not been there, when lenders aren't all that eager to lend money, in fact, very averse to it, but nonetheless, they almost can't. And I'd just like to use a, uh, give you a few examples of, of uh, what I have in mind. I'm aware of a small company in Southern California who would like to expand its plant and build more widgets of some kind and sell them to the marketplace. They have a good sound business plan. They believe that they can justify the credit. It appears to be a good business. If they buy the plant and control it and build it for themselves, they'll be the only user of it. But then it'll be a real estate loan that they're seeking from their bank. So the real estate loan will be very difficult to get because it will take extra time. It will cost additional money to get it done. Um, and therefore, all market indications point to them leasing the space rather than buying it. But if they lease it, then they have to pay someone else a profit for the space, and it costs them more for the space. They are currently in the business of seeking a real estate loan for their proposed expansion of their project. Realistically, no bank can make them the loan because banks have to shed assets because of the capital adequacy requirements, and banks are fearful of making new real estate loans at all because they don't really want to add more real estate loans to an already burdened portfolio. And therefore, net effect in Southern California, trying to find a $2 million loan for a $4 million plant is a near impossibility. Banks are simply unwilling to provide it because it's tainted by real estate. Uh, and this is for a business whose future business would appear to justify the making of such a loan and the ability to repay it based upon future profits. Uh, what does the business choose to do? It chooses to forego the potential of additional business and uh, hire fewer people or not increase its hiring as much, take less risk, and the bankers, of course, end up with no loan, which is just fine with them because a lot of them are trying to shrink assets, not increase them. Uh, so you end up in a situation where a good, sound business otherwise appears to be creditworthy in every respect literally cannot find money. Uh, but that's a credit crunch by whatever term you want to use. Um, another example I'd like to give you um, is um, in a situation where uh, we have uh, a series of retail stores, grocery stores, um, which uh, would like ad again to expand or, or expand and or acquire another business that has grocery stores. If they do an entire stock transaction uh, for business purposes, um, they can accomplish the corporate transaction without appearing to pass the real estate. They merely buy the company. Uh, but doing a stock transaction for tax reasons, since we change rules about acquisitions, is difficult and undesirable because you, in plain cases, have to inherit the tax liability of the party you're buying from. So it's not a desirable structure. So instead, they would like to buy assets. But if they buy assets, they need to get 
real estate related financing instead of company related financing. As soon as it's secured, the price goes up um, so that there will be additional time to get the transaction done, additional appraisal fees, and then if the appraisal of the real estate only looks poor, it'll end up reducing the amount of money available for the transaction, not make it work. Um, I cite these as examples not because uh, they show that in no cases can any qualified borrower obtain funds for any real estate purpose, but rather that FIREA, in the terms it requires, will not advance the banking system's desire to provide flexible and reasonable credit to prudent borrowers and prudent lenders. Um, it is my observation that a couple of the changes that the Congress might consider to FIREA without wholesale junking it um, would be in reviewing it to notice the difference between the word shall and the word may um, in the requirements to say to parties to a transaction and to lenders and the regulators where there is no net cash invested in a real estate transaction, where it's a zero cash investment, all lending transaction, certain rules shall apply. Where there are some minimum cash investments, then certain rules may apply. And in the, in the good faith business judgment of the lending institution, the lender will decide what should apply rather than either the regulator um, or a legislature. A second suggestion I would make is that when defining what is a real estate related loan that does require an appraisal in the first place, if the Congress <laughs> should decide that appraisal should be required um, as an additional check on an independent information for a lender, I would recommend that the idea of what a real estate loan is be redefined into one that is exclusively or primarily based upon the real estate value as the source of repayment and not incidentally as collateral not as part of a corporate acquisition, which is otherwise justified by the economics, uh, not by the, um, if there is credit outside of the real estate value from the cash flow of a business, that the full requirement of independent appraisals uh, probably is not very worth the bargain. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Cox. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. That was uh, especially helpful testimony and, and certainly worth the wait. I hope it was also, uh, for you, worth the wait to provide it to us. Uh, I, I wonder uh, if I might try and synthesize my questions into uh, treating both of your testimonies, because obviously you're talking about uh, overall the same phenomenon. Uh, in March of this year, on March 5th, I wrote a letter to uh, Secretary Benson. In fact, I was able to hand it to him personally when he was testifying before us in the Budget Committee, of which I'm a member. And I uh, included in my recommendations uh, in that letter uh, a specific recommendation that uh, uh, the Treasury uh, push regulations that uh, provide for uh, different standards where a uh, borrower has made a cash investment in a real estate transaction. Uh, five, ten percent, let's say. Uh, in addition to that, I also uh, uh, recommended uh, a few other things. Uh, uh, employment of the safe harbor concept in, in regulations. Uh, a requirement that there be prior administrative review uh, at the top uh, of any restrictive determinations by the field auditors and people uh, at the bottom. Uh, I suggested that our regulations direct appraisers to have a best case, worst case, and middle ground scenario so that we can deal with this problem that Mr. Harnsberger mentioned of uh, uh, overly scientific uh, focus on that final number when the process that led to it is so unscientific. Uh, and I uh, suggested that there be special rules for uh, loans extended on existing projects in the workout scenario. I have not heard back from Secretary Benson on any of these issues. I hope that we hear soon uh, because, uh, quite frankly, uh, uh, I directed some of those same recommendations to the Bush administration and never heard back uh, uh, except uh, to say thanks for your comment uh, uh, during all of those years. You encountered uh, that too, huh? Yes, yes, in fact, uh, many of us uh, perhaps here on the panel encountered that. Uh, we've been hearing a great deal from uh, both President Clinton and from the administration that preceded him uh, about what we're going to do, and yet uh, we haven't yet uh, achieved the result. Uh, I, I wonder if uh, uh, we could just address these recommendations uh, uh, because they go to capital requirements, they go to business judgment, they go to appraisals uh, uh, generally sort of, uh, in whatever order you'd like. 
uh, so that we can lay out for the record precisely what it is that we think can be done by regulation, even short of law, uh, short of Congress passing a new statute. Uh, uh, when Mr. Altman was here testifying before this subcommittee on behalf of the Treasury, I specifically suggested to him uh, that they employ the safe harbor concept, and he said, what is that? So I wonder if I just might begin by asking you how that concept, uh, which we use uh, both in the tax realm and the securities realm, might be used by regulators who want to encourage lending rather than restrict it. Well, uh, uh, Congressman Cox, needless to say, uh, I support those recommendations. Uh, and um, uh, I think that, uh, to me, the uh, uh, sort of the rock bottom uh, point on it is to put some flexibility back into the regulatory process so that the bankers uh, are in an environment where they are encouraged to exercise uh, good, sound business judgment and there, as you have suggested, uh, are either safe harbors uh, or in as part of the appraisal process, uh, rather than focus on a specific single appraisal number and a loan-to-value ratio, it's possible for uh, the bankers to operate within ranges, uh, again, to provide them with the, the flexibility uh, to have uh, business judgment uh, operate. Uh, I think, uh, for example, of a, a particular loan uh, that I was involved in involving a fast food chain uh, where there were a myriad of postage stamp sized pieces of real estate which the lenders wanted as collateral. The lenders wanted that collateral not because uh, it represented valuable real estate, it represented the distribution network through which the product would flow. They didn't want that to become encumbered in any other way. That was an exercise of sound business judgment. It happened to result in a lien on real estate and therefore put them into the appraisal requirements. Um, it was totally uh, uneconomic to have appraisals on every single one of these little postage stamp sized pieces of real estate that represented the distribution network. Uh, and the point of it uh, uh, wasn't value. The point of it was to assure that that network would remain unencumbered uh, and viable for the purposes of having the business remain viable. That's exactly the sort of thing where uh, uh, I think the sort of safe harbor that you're referring to would, uh, would be valuable because that wouldn't be defined as a real estate related loan, I think, under a properly structured regulation. Uh, so uh, I think each of the points you have made uh, would be very useful in the uh, firea fiducia uh, context, uh, and um, uh, I think you can uh, 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 look to areas besides the real estate appraisal area. For example, um, uh, in um, I think it's section 132 of uh, FIDUCIA, uh, the regulatory agencies are required to prescribe standards for safety and soundness on such day-to-day -day management uh, items as internal controls, information systems, uh, internal audit systems, loan documentation, credit underwriting standards, uh, interest rate exposure. Uh, the idea of having the regulators get into, in effect, the management of the banks by uh, providing standards in those areas just isn't, uh, to me, uh, sensible. And I think the regulators recognize that. I think they've tried to respond by uh, uh, not uh, being specific in those standards, but instead by outlining the policies that they expect the bankers to follow. And I think that's an illustration of a situation where regulators are, uh, they're sort of doing the best they can to follow the idea that you have uh, suggested in your letter, but they're terribly hemmed in by an overly restrictive uh, statutory provision. Mr. Harnsberg. Uh, I would add that uh, uh, CERCLA, the uh, Comprehensive Environmental Responsibility and Liability Act, uh, also casts an overhang over real estate lending in particular uh, in ways that were probably not intended. And the definition of responsible parties is so broad that when I work on a loan workout, as I do with some of my lender clients, it tends to overwhelm the question whether the borrower can repay the loan, which we've already assumed probably isn't the case and the lender studies at great length whether the lender can afford to take the risk of reacquiring the property uh, because of the specter of not being able to sell it fast enough to get out from under liability. 
uh, and then ending up with a huge contingent liability for environmental cleanup on a piece of property where it never at any time had ever acted in a way that would hold it culpable for what's on the property. I should add that I have sponsored legislation, I think a number of members of this panel have as well, uh, to uh, eliminate that kind of lender liability. Uh, what we're talking about is a, a lender that unwittingly comes into the chain of title, if, uh, I shouldn't say unwittingly, but certainly unintentionally, uh, uh, because of foreclosure or some other uh, proceeding after the uh, loan goes into default. Uh, uh, there is no reason in the world to deter people from lending on real estate uh, when they are not owners, they are only lenders, and I think that's what CERCLA tends to do. Uh, so uh, I fully support uh, uh, that proposal for reform that you're talking about, and I think other members of this panel do. We have a heck of a time, however, uh, convincing people that uh, uh, this is actually good for the environment, uh, as well as uh, all concerned, because it will provide liquidity in the system and permit people who have some money to actually acquire the property uh, and uh, uh, clean it up if need be. I, I wonder if you just might uh, comment on uh, although we're here to talk about the credit crunch, uh, we can't solve this problem unless we can satisfy the environmental concern. Uh, what's the uh, uh, upside for the environment uh, if we get rid of this kind of lender liability? Well, uh, the upside for the environment is that the parties who are responsible for placing the contamination there are still responsible. And if they can be found and hauled to account, uh, they can be required to pay. But the lender who made a loan to facilitate some other purpose unrelated to the contamination being placed there, uh, if the lender is swayed against making such a loan or acting on it after, then you have a property that's in limbo per perpetually. I might add there are a number of improved structures in this country that have asbestos, which uh, is not old enough to be dangerous, but is still there and was there at a time that that was a common practice uh, 10, 20 years ago. And uh, those properties are also going to end up, end up in limbo. But the reason I mention it, uh, Congressman Cox, is that the circle of liability is a liability potential where the, da the downside is so out of proportion to the upside that if a lender is told you're going to make 7 or 8 or 9 percent interest for making a loan and you might pay $50 million if certain things happen in the future, it maybe tends to diminish your ardor to make the loan. And given that, and given the fact that we don't have safe harbors in the environmental area, a uh, term that you used, and given that we do not have safe harbors in, uh, and, and in fact we have cases where the regulators have sought to impose a standard much uh, more difficult, uh, much more problematic for bankers than uh, gross negligence or bad faith, uh, we've ended up in a situation where there are a number of disincentives which added together create a heck of a disincentive. Uh, so uh, CERCLA is, no, the environmental question you've asked, uh, I have no desire to see the environment uh, additionally damaged. The question is who's responsible for what's already there? And the answer is the lender didn't put it there and had no responsibility knowingly at the time. Uh, and if there's a decision in this country that the lenders should and could be held accountable and left up in the air, it's uncertain, then the lenders will be very uncertain about making loans on properties that have the remotest risk, um, which tends to diminish the ability of properties to be put into the stream of commerce and and uh, the ability of people to buy them and solve the problems. Uh, that's very helpful, both uh, uh, for our purposes and for the record. Uh, something that uh, Mr. Puleo said in his uh, testimony and in his formal remarks, uh, I think deserves repeating so much so that I actually want to read it, make sure I get it exactly right. It, it, you said, Mr. Puleo, it is difficult for banks to earn a competitive return merely by collecting deposits and lending them out to commercial borrowers. Uh, if I can shorten that a little bit, what you're saying is very difficult for banks to make money by uh, taking deposits and lending it. Uh, is that what uh, regulation has made of this system, that uh, uh, we cannot uh, uh, make money the old-fashioned way and we've got to get very fancy with securitization and so on? Uh, is there anything that we can do to uh, 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 fix that problem? Why is it that banks can't make money by taking deposits and lending it? Well, I think that uh, there are a number of uh, uh, factors, uh, Congressman Cox. Uh, certainly the, the regulatory burden that a number of your witnesses today have described uh, in terms particularly of the cost element of it is a major contributor to, uh, uh, to uh, that profitability problem. 
Uh, I think there are other. Um, I think there are other contributing factors uh, having to do with the uh, disintermediation, in effect, of banks themselves, uh, the ability of many of their customers to go directly to the capital markets, uh, and uh, uh, this has uh, had an effect on, on bank profitability as well. Um, uh, other sort of market structural factors, uh, I think, are uh, at work here in addition to uh, the, um, uh, the, the cost of regulation. Uh, it's sort of, uh, uh, in its broadest sense, it goes to the question of the value of a banking charter uh, today as compared to pursuing some of the same activities which can be pursued without a banking charter. Uh, one of your early, earlier witnesses referred to the difficulty of competing in certain lines of business with unregulated uh, uh, financial uh, intermediaries or financial service providers. Uh, and I think that structural problem is uh, uh, also at work here. Um, and there are a number of structural uh, uh, changes which have been uh, recommended by bankers, which were considered and favorably uh, uh, recommended in the original Treasury report, which I think led to, uh, in part, to the uh, FIREA uh, legislation and uh, the, the Treasury reform bill, which didn't really uh, end up being passed in its uh, uh, original recommended uh, form. Uh, I'm referring to things like interstate banking, uh, interstate branching, uh, to be more specific, uh, and to additional powers uh, uh, for banks in uh, areas which are uh, very closely related to their mainstream commercial wholesale banking. Uh, such as uh, the ability to uh, operate on a level playing field in the securities uh, world. So I think all of those factors are uh, contributors to that uh, conclusion. Uh, well, the great irony is that you mentioned that uh, uh, some of the largest borrowers, uh, potentially good customers of commercial banks, have direct access to the capital markets. Uh, that causes, as you say, disintermediation. Uh, that would suggest as a business plan for commercial banks that they concentrate even more efforts on smaller borrowers and try and make it up on volume. And yet what we've heard in all the testimony today, uh, in particular from Consuelo Pope, who's still here with us, uh, uh, or perhaps she's not. Is she still here? Yes, she is. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, is that uh, a small business uh, is not getting the loans that they deserve because basically the paperwork required to document a small loan is the same paperwork required to document a big loan. And so uh, uh, banks are not in the business that we wish that they were in, which is taking deposits and making loans, and, and we've got to do other things. Well, uh, uh, perhaps uh, this hearing will lead to some reforms in that area. I wonder if I could address a final question to Tom Harnsberger and ask uh, uh, your uh, legal advice uh, to the extent that uh, your practice has made you familiar with this. Uh, how much reform can we do in the appraisal area to uh, rectify some of the problems created by FIREA through regulation? Uh, how much can uh, uh, Treasury Secretary Benson and the Comptroller of the Currency and the other regulators, the FDIC and so on, do uh, to solve this problem without having to go back to Congress and change the law? Uh, can we do it through safe harbors, for example? Can we do it through a spread with uh, best case, worst case, uh, in intermediate uh, appraisals or some other device? I think there is some latitude to accomplish it by regulation, but in cases where Congress has previously said shall, I'm not sure that the administration would be within its prerogative at, in saying shall not, um, or shall means may. Yes. Uh, so I think that some of it, technically, if I went back and looked at FIREA line by line, there are probably several words in there that would have to change in order to change some of the full gamut of what you probably desire to change if you decided to correct the definition, for example, of what's a real estate loan is in there. And I don't, it's not a regulation. So I think that you'd actually have to address it by st uh, legislation. A great degree of what the regulators are intended to do with the results of their examinations can be done by regulation, but not solely. Uh, and I might add that uh, while I offer the historical perspective that FIREA was enacted after the horse was already out of the barn, uh, that nonetheless uh, the uh, benefits of FIREA, such as the benefits of additional information, independent information, uh, where valuable, certainly are very important uh, to people who were in the lending business who didn't have enough information. 
but it is my sincere belief that most of the lenders, certainly the ones I work with, do have enough information about value and don't need an independent appraisal. And they also have a sincere and devoted desire to abide by the law, to listen carefully to the legislative and regulatory pronouncements, uh, and to do what is required. Uh, I think a lot could be accomplished by regulation and exhortation in that regard, because if the rules said much more clearly, or the statements in writing said much more clearly, when you have exercised your good faith to do X, Y, Z, then you are in a safe harbor. I think people would hear it, they'd hear it like thunder. Uh, at the same time, I don't think that all of that would be lawful without some congressional action. Well, I thank you both, and uh, I'll yield to my colleagues for further questions. Mr. Zellif, uh, and could I, can we just try to I, I take will, about one uh, question a piece and wrap it up in your interest and ours too, so we can bring this to a conclusion? I'll now. just say, in the interest of time, Mr. Chairman, I think Mr. Cox has uh, covered the ground very adequately, and I think testimony has been outstanding. Chase, Mr. Rush. Mr. Chairman, I just have one question, and I'm not sure. Uh, Mr. Pulio, uh, Pulio, rather, uh, in terms of securitization, uh, what impact would that have on, on consumers? Uh, uh, does securitization require that, uh, that there be higher service fees, as, uh, and that banks would begin to depend more on service fees as opposed to uh, interest income? I think that uh, uh, from the point of view of the bank, the consequence is that the bank would receive servicing fees rather than net interest margin. Mm -hmm. But from the point of view of the consumer, I think securitization properly done should be beneficial because it really represents a more efficient way to finance the carrying of the consumer receivables, whether they're mortgages, credit card receivables, automobile loans, uh, the objective of the uh, securitization is to provide a source of financing off of the bank's balance sheet, away from the bank's balance sheet, which is actually a cheaper source of funds. Uh, and uh, if uh, the market is working with efficiency, uh, that should be reflected back to the consumer, uh, as well as giving the bank the advantage of uh, being able to be paid for the servicing that it's doing uh, a fair compensation and continuing to earn some money uh, from the assets it originated without itself having to incur the expense of financing those assets. Interestingly enough, I, I would agree with you, but our witnesses have tended to take a contrary view. You heard a couple of witnesses just before you took the attitude that if we uh, pass Velda Sue and institutionalizes securitization of commercial loans, and we also tend to make uh, commercial banks think in cookie cutter terms. Can I fit this particular small business loan into the package that will be required, the standardized terms that will be required, so that I can uh, sell it in the secondary markets? And that will kind of straightjacket their attitudes uh, about small loan uh, right. applications. Or commercial applications. Mm. Chairman Spratt, I think there is that, uh, I think there is that risk, but uh, 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 I think that um, uh, there are uh, benefits there as well, and it's a matter, again, it seems to me, of pursuing the subject matter with some balance, uh, particularly alleviation of some of the capital requirements associated with securitization to make those requirements more proportionate to the risks that are being incurred by the selling institutions uh, would be beneficial, and that certainly doesn't run the risk of uh, the standardization that uh, the other witnesses, I think, were properly concerned about. I might add, uh, Chairman Spratt, that if uh, a larger amount of money available for a particular purpose doesn't diminish the price of the money, that the normal laws of economics wouldn't apply, and that anyone who would be averse to this, that would be concerned as a lender about the standardization probably wouldn't be making the loan in the first place. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your testimony. It's been extremely helpful, and we appreciate also, as I said earlier, your patience and forbearance in waiting to testify last. Thank, Thank you, you for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Uh,
Send your comments on this hearing to the House Government Operations Subcommittee on Commerce, Consumer, and Monetary Affairs. The address is B-377, Rayburn House Office Building in Washington, D.C. The zip code is 20515. The most powerful court in the land, the Supreme Court of the United States. Learn more about this American institution with Justice for All. Justice for All.